Ωραία, καλησπέρα σας. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. We're starting in one minute. Καλησπέρα, good afternoon, hello everyone. So my name is Anne Mitropoulou. I'm the executive director of the Cyclades Preservation Fund, the CPF. So again, on behalf of my team and all the members of our organization, I would like once more to welcome, warmly welcome you to the final webinar of this series of four from the Green Volunteers in the Cyclades program, planned and organized by us, Cyclades Preservation Fund team, co-funded and supported by the British Embassy in Athens. Our uh, vision for these English-speaking webinars was and remains to engage visitors and seasonal residents of the Aegean in actions and initiatives with a positive ecological impact on the islands. We hope we manage to share some knowledge and inspiration from the previous webinars for the travelers to put hands, hearts and minds towards keeping the Cyclades flourishing while visiting or staying on the islands. And furthermore, consider becoming green volunteers through small or big actions that support the preservation of the natural environment and the people, the local champions and organizations of the Cyclades, who in turn share so generously their experience and wisdom. Today, we will focus more on how we can better understand and respect the context and our role as travelers in the Cyclades. We will explore and showcase a menu of actions for visitors to contribute to healthy islands and mitigate harm. We will also meet wonderful local initiatives that embody regenerative tourism services. We invite all our guests and participants in the web today to find the green side of the Cycladic tourism through this discussion with support of material and links that will follow. At this point, please allow me just to say a few words about the CPF for those who joined us today for the first time as an introduction. So at the CPF, we support local initiatives in the Cyclades. We implement campaigns to promote the preservation of the natural environment on the islands. In five years of work, the CPF has invested more than 400,000 euros and supported more than 65 environmental initiatives on the ground. We have achieved this in collaboration with more than 40 local partners and experts in around 20 Cycladic islands, as we believe that change comes from the bottom up. We are a member of the Global Network, the Conservation Collective, a network of 20 local foundations which enable actions that address global environmental issues in a local manner. The cornerstone of the CPF mission is the empowerment of local communities, backed up by investment in the local environment and in the education of visitors, residents, about how they can protect the natural environment by making the right choices when it matters the most. Let me please note that we offer these webinars freely with the kind support of the British Embassy, but any support, of course, in donation, amplification or other, makes a difference for us and for the natural environment of the, CP of the Cyclades. CPF and our partners are non-for-profit entities, so please consider donating to the CPF or to the local Cycladic associations of your preference to help elevate our work preserving the Cyclades. I would like once more to thank and congratulate my colleagues, Mrs. Nasia Casella and Mrs. Dorothy Filiotis, for their excellent work of our team. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today and enjoy, I wish you enjoy the webinar and you find it as fruitful as you did the previous one. Thank you again for the positive and uh, very warm um, feedback that you shared with us for the previous uh, webinars. Uh, unless we have a representative from the British Embassy, which I don't see, right? I guess I'm going to give the floor directly to my colleague, Nasi Kasela. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Annie, for the introduction. Uh, I will be coordinating today's uh, webinar uh, with the help also of Dorothy Filiotis, who is also coordinating the Green Volunteers in the Cyclades program. 
Um, we have with us today and would like to thank them, uh, Sabine, uh, Lenny that will be joining us later, Zana that you saw in the presenter's note, unfortunately she won't be with us today, but Dorothy will be presenting instead of her uh, the initiative that Zana would participate for. We will tell you more when the session comes. Maria and Anthe. So thank you everyone to our presenters for um, the day. Uh, we see a lot of uh, friends uh, joining as well. Hello, Madeline. Thank you for opening <laughs> the camera so we can see you. I also saw Philip earlier today. We said hello to, to Uli and there are a few more people, but it's always nicer if you guys want to open up your camera. That'd be great. Um, so regarding today's uh, program and purpose, we are here to introduce trends in ecotourism to visitors and to the tourism sector. Uh, as well as to present some local initiatives, as Annie mentioned. The aim is to make vacation in the Cyclades somehow more aligned with the local environment by giving you examples of how uh, each of us can do better when we visit uh, the islands. The program will run in three sessions with two breaks in between. Uh, Zabina will be our main presenter, and I will tell you more about her in a minute. She will start off with a general presentation, um, more, let's say, academic and methodological. And then uh, we're going to have a Q&A for her. Uh, we will uh, watch probably a short video, depending on time. We will have our first break. Then Zabine will introduce uh, how we can measure and mitigate our impact on the islands. We will have the presentation of Clean Blue Paros. Then we will have the presentation of Sustainable Greece uh, platform from the GNTO uh, UK office. Another break, then Zabine will introduce us how we can compensate and contribute to the local environment as visitors. And we will have Maria from Argos and Anthe from Santorini presenting their initiatives, and we will close off with a small discussion. So let's start with uh, Zabine. So Zabine Papas uh, from the Mediterranean Center of Environment and the Discovery Iraqia Initiative. Thank you, Zabine, for being with us. Uh, working with the Mediterranean Center of the Environment, uh, some of you may also have heard of it as MCE and other European partners on an extensive platform addressing tourism and climate change, Sabine will set the foundations for us to understand and act in regenerative ways to the context of cycladic tourism, bringing experience from the field with Discovery Akla, which offers nature walking tours. Sabine is a true lover of the Cyclades because besides Irakla, she has also lived in Amorgos and she travels across the Cycladic Islands frequently and all year round. So she has a lot of knowledge from the field. Zabine, the floor is yours. You can share your screen and start with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasia. Thank you, Annie and Dorothy for having me. So let me start the share and... If that works for you if now. You, if you could make it full screen, Sabina. Um, I'm afraid it would be um, a little complicated for me so as to be also able to follow my notes. Okay, then go go ahead as uh, as it's more comfortable for you. Thank you. Let me just do a small check on that. And yeah, I'm afraid we'll have to keep it this way for now. <laughs> so thank you all for joining in. Um, it sounds like a, an ambitious mission that I've been given. <laughs> um, I will uh, do my best to at least um, take us on uh, what I propose to be another way of, of traveling, uh, what uh, we all the more uh, refer to as uh, responsible, potentially regenerative as well. Um, it would be up to us to, to discuss uh, all the different tenets of this uh, high complexity issue. Uh, indeed, my mission in this first part will be, will be to bring uh, as much context for our, for, to create shared understanding. And uh, based on that, of course, to accommodate as many questions and uh, discussion as possible. Um, as opposed to possibly the, the previous three webinars, I'm not coming in with let's say, an identity of an expert, but much more of an amateur in the etymological sense of lover of the cyclists, while also bringing in, indeed, uh, various um, data and uh, experience-based um, elements 
which uh, will be an invitation afterwards for all of you to explore because one of the main intentions also for making this was to create uh, shareable resources that all of us afterwards can uh, use, put into practice, disseminate as much as possible. So these are the elements that I wish us to take on. And um, for us today, I have uh, identified, let's say, an intention uh, that would be to locate ourselves once again in the circle, as you see our beautiful circle here from Paros six months ago in uh, one of the multiple spaces that the CPF creates in person as well as now online uh, for all those lovers of the cyclists to meet and share and create together. And uh, to locate ourselves, uh, it usually helps, <laughs> at least a guide would say, to have uh, some perspective, to have a sort of, uh, of map and uh, broader context. And this is where also I am bringing in experience from um, a specific uh, European project in which uh, I am involved, and uh, I will be letting you know um, a lot of information about it. <laughs> so, um, in terms of situating ourselves, um, I'd like, since this is the the final, let's say, in the series of four webinars, to also uh, set some uh, reminders and uh, possibly contextual elements that are important into why we're discussing in such detail uh, the cyclades as uh, uh, one of the many places on earth which uh, would be worth preserving and, and uh, regenerating. And for this, I want to quote again, I don't know if uh, she's around here today, uh, the words of Elena, who spoke of uh, fascinating enchantment with this corner of the world and uh, gave us, um, as alongside the, the many other presenters, of course, the, the specificities in terms of geology, climate, biodiversity, and human activity that uh, make the cyclades so special and uh, outstanding, not only for Greek, but for European standards, uh, which is why we are possibly focusing so much on, on this rare gem. Um, it's also particularly nice for me to be speaking after uh, we've uh, di di dive, dive deep into the sea and uh, discovered the plants uh, that live there for over 120 million years. We, we spoke of the Posidonia meadows in the first place, afterwards also discovering the, the animal inhabitants of the deep seas turtles again also dated uh, to an age that uh, so much uh, predates that predates us that it is hard to to even conceive of and thereafter on the land uh, we also saw how the rich biodiversity encountered uh, in such a, um, a rare pocket of of land as the cyclids uh, brings as as uh, magic and specificity. We're talking about uh, a percentage which compared to the, the surface of the land is uh, uh, completely remarkable. And um, I guess these peculiarities uh, make this place stand out for Greece and for the reasons of their attractiveness, I believe, uh, which is uh, <laughs> both uh, a blessing and a curse. And uh, this is the, the case for many other places on earth currently, uh, which brings us to some uh, facts, which uh, would say um, pose a challenging context for, for all of us and for the, the more than human world, even more so. Uh, and some of these facts, as you can uh, see from the data I gathered from the European projects in question, uh, of which I am coordinating uh, a part. It is called the Acting for Responsible European Tourism. Uh, the, the French acronym AT is, uh, is the title of it. And um, it tends towards uh, low carbon travel. So um, the, the um, observation uh, on which uh, it is based and linked to this attractiveness of, uh, among other, the cyclades, is that the growth in numbers of tourism has been exponential 
uh, in the past 20 years. We have indicatively from 700 million tourists in 2002, gone up to 1.5 billion in 2019. <laughs> and thereby, of course, go the uh, corresponding figures in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, which now account for 10% of the global emissions. So the, the tourism sector in total is uh, now considered responsible for 10% of the world GHG emissions, 77% uh, of which are from transport alone. Thereby, <laughs> uh, with this, um, let's say, double-edged sword of tourism being uh, both um, a force for, for change, for growth, uh, but also apparently a, a destructive uh, one on many more domains, of course, than possibly what's encapsulated uh, by GHG emissions. Mm, this is only, of course, the, the framing that we are bringing through this project, the lens through which uh, I can mostly speak of today. Uh, but keeping in mind, of course, the dimensions uh, of, of this phenomenon are, are much broader. Um, still, it presents an entry point into which we can also intervene if we, if we choose a specific lens through which to view it. And thus, the mission um, based on these observations is to uh, control the contribution of the tourism sector uh, in terms of uh, its impacts on, on climate change. And the, the ways, the means that we have uh, given ourselves to do that is by uh, creating three educational tools, virtual uh, tools, uh, one massive online open course for uh, address to travel agencies and tour operators, so mostly the producers of tourism, one um, application and mostly interactive website, uh, not so much of an app as you would imagine, um, addressed to the sector of hosts, which includes from um, accommodation to transportation, to guides, to uh, site managers, um, and uh, also cooks. So five sectors of the hosting activity and uh, an online game for the wider audience, the wider public, us travelers. Uh, these, uh, these three tools are at the moment uh, in, in midway, let's say in their, their production. Um, the, the final del delivery will be by springtime 2024, so within a year, uh, I should be able to offer you as well, since this will be openly shared, of course, as any uh, European project of this kind is. Um, yes, and um, an element about it that I believe uh, brings some richness to whatever it is I will also be presenting today is the fact that it is... Uh, a five country cooperation with um, the um, stakeholders of uh, all other countries except for Greece being networks of actors within the, the tourism sector. Uh, for France, for example, it is uh, uh, pretty well known at least uh, in, the, in the French domain um, network of responsible tourism providers mostly tour operators and agents, uh, but also DMCs and uh, some individuals that are acting within it. There is the equivalent for uh, Italy, so Agir pour un tourisme responsable in, in France, AITER uh, in Italy, COAN in Spain, again, a network of uh, producers, and in Belgium, the same. In Greece, uh, which is uh, partly... <laughs> <laughs> well, it is not a coincidence. Um, we are the, um, and I am representing today the Mediterranean Center of Environment, the more the the most humble, uh, let's say, in terms of scope, um, stakeholder. Uh, starting for the for its first uh, twenty three years of existence as exclusively an environmental education organization, uh, the Mediterranean Center of Environment, and within the seven latest years also with um, activities linked to responsible tourism. So a little bit of about this context to guide you also into the um, type of uh, framework and the reason why we have chosen 
this architecture of uh, the webinar today as understanding and then measuring, mitigating, contributing. Within all of these slides that I'm showing, there are quite a number of uh, links and uh, so uh, clickable resources, which you will afterwards receive together with an accompanying document that lets you explore these uh, much further. So I will not necessarily be pointing them out uh, all here. You can explore these further afterwards. Going a little bit more contextual uh, after we've uh, zoomed in out of the, the European context within Greece. Um, some of the facts that uh, we know is that almost 20% of the GDP of the country uh, is uh, dependent on tourist, tourist activity. It is set to account for a quarter of the GDP by 2028 with approximately 20% of the labor force involved in the industry directly or indirectly. Thus, heavy dependence there, we, we definitely notice. And at the same time as this dependence set for the past 60 years alongside the paradigm of uh, sea, sun and sand vacations, we are also observe, uh, observing the um, tendency towards um, new kinds or um, ancient new <laughs> models of, of traveling based on the triptych of uh, the three F now replacing the three S, Fisi for nature, Philia for friendship, and Philoxenia for hosting and uh, hospitality. Um, thus, uh, even though, as I shared previously, uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> I did something wrong. Yes. Um, we do not in Greece yet uh, encounter something equivalent to the network of uh, responsible tourism actors that we find for France or Spain at the moment, um, or at least not to our knowledge in the research that has been done through the, the MC up, up until now. We do nevertheless find some uh, coalitions of actors around the domain of eco-tourism with uh, the specific, let's say, uh, ecological focus on it, agro-tourism on the agro-touristic part. And these are the, the websites that are referred to here below. And also, of course, uh, I account as uh, one of the these uh, invaluable networks, the, the CPF uh, itself, in terms of uh, um, coalescing, again, actors of uh, sustainable, responsible change. It's, uh, a bit of a, a nice diversity in there, uh, as well as the network that uh, hopefully Eleni will be presenting to us later on today on Sustainable Greece. So all of these, again, are rich resources in which um, in Greece, uh, we, I guess we, we have to make the extra effort and go the extra mile, as was frequently said in this series of webinars, to find things out and uh, make the right choices. Wanting to help a bit more in this direction, uh, I'm proposing here also more of a, um, a personal call uh, in terms of reminding and understanding uh, ourselves as uh, powerful actors of change as well within the specific domain of the cyclists that we visit. Why? Because our choices make a huge difference in a sector where responding to demand is uh, one of the basic tenets. Also because as visitors on the, the field, we're ideally placed to create real connections between nature, culture, and the people there. Oops. And <laughs> I'll have to hurry up for the next one. Um, we're also ideally poised to become ambassadors. And I believe that if we are joining today here, uh, part of our uh, um, let's say possibly secret hope is to to spread the messages that uh, that uh, we receive and create further awareness. And at the same time, as we have these uh, roles and possibilities, we also face specific challenges uh, which may not be immediately obvious to understand. Um, 
especially because compared to other places on Earth uh, at this moment in time, it might not always be directly visible. The fact that, for instance, we, we are dependent on the destination in the sense that uh, if the destination is altered, uh, degraded in ways that no longer please us, uh, as travelers, we can always or will always opt out of it. And we're at the same time witnesses of the effects of over-tourism and climate change. Every summer, all the more, we hear of the water shortages in, on specific islands. I believe uh, that it's a safe bet that all of us have uh, experienced power cuts during the summer. Uh, we have seen uh, the um, um, elements of drought and, uh, and how it affects vegetation. If we, the, the longer we stay on a place, the, the more uh, obvious these effects uh, become. Uh, and what comes with these effects are increased risks and constraints, which again might not be directly perceptible. Although the congestion on the roads, on airports, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, waste and water facilities become saturated, there are points, uh, some more tragic than others, that uh, we become aware of these. And um, a lot of our uh, uh, models for predictions um, sadly speak of uh, all the more alarming situations to, to come. I will pause here uh, for now, leaving it open to, to further discussion. Many of these points will, uh, will come back again in uh, the two other parts that we have for today. But um, now we would be all ears for questions and reactions on your side. Thank you, Sabine. So you're welcome everyone to post any questions you may have on the, on the chat. Um, I already have like some, some things just to comment that we've discussed uh, in the past, but you will also mention later about how we can measure our impact. Um, so don't want to be repetitive, but it would be interesting also, like how would we um, try to, to reduce our footprint, not only the carbon footprint, but our effect on um, changing biodiversity or reverse that um, through choices that we make in specific initiatives that allow us to be part of the regenerative tourism, as you also as you also call it, and be part of a more mild uh, tourism, let's say. So I would be happy if you could share with us a few examples from your own uh, experience in the Cyclades or elsewhere as well, like some more practical examples. Um, not to be repetitive with what comes later, but you know what comes later, so maybe some some different examples. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, maybe Nasia. Um... So as not to be repetitive and go into um, more of the, the practical uh, aspects of it, something that, uh, especially with this understanding part, uh, I would want to point out, and, and it's something that we frequently discuss um, also within the European partnership, is, uh, is more of an um, underlying, let's say, fundamental principle that uh, uh, has changed and has the potential to change with a lot of effect. And this has to do with uh, imaginary. So I, I briefly pointed towards it when juxtaposing the sea, sun and sand model with the Fisifilia phylloxemia. Uh, and um, when going into a brief, let's say, study of the, the sector of tourism, what is um, uh, quite tremendously striking is to see on, on which types of stories it has been uh, built upon. Um, and the fact that uh, these are very influential and continue to be. So apparently, I don't remember the exact percentage, but uh, a really significant proportion of French tourists, for example, will travel to a place because of its, because of its um, Instagrammable potential. <laughs> so uh, all, all of these uh, uh, growth in numbers 
which currently poses the, the maximal threat, is also linked to the, the kinds of uh, ideas we project about that, the kind of also uh, social statues, for example, that travel um, has been um, um, accorded in, in our societies. And um, making a shift in this cultural trend seems now not only to be necessary because we cannot do otherwise, uh, but hopefully it is something that uh, can also um, be something of pleasure and something to celebrate for us as well as, uh, as a new way of experiencing whose impacts can be tremendous on, on our location. That would be my response so as not to spoil the uh, practicalities of the, the afterwards. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other question in the chat, so I will go on with one. Ah, there is a question. Okay, there are two questions that just showed up. So mine was going to be like, if you had any comment on the fact that in Greece, you, you have not yet located networks like the ones you're using in Africa from other countries and also address to you, if like how one would go about in creating such a network and who would need to be an entity that would initiate this, or if someone from the audience has some uh, idea already about maybe existing networks that you were not able to find in your in your research. Um, I would love it if we could extend the question indeed uh, and potentially learn about something we haven't yet encountered. Okay, so then let's move to the questions from the chat and then we can come back to it if we have any reaction from, from our audience. So, um, Philip, hi, Philip. Uh, he's asking, do we know how current ecotourism businesses are doing economically? Are there good examples of existing businesses models that could attract entrepreneurs away from the standard sun sea sand type of businesses? There's also a like by Miss Amalia uh, Zepu that I know is active in Sifnos. Mm -hmm. Happy to have you with us. Well, yeah, thank you very much for the, the question, which also highlights uh, the, the other underlying principle, right, between the the exponential growth in numbers and, and the fact that it is currently coupled with uh, economic growth uh, might be something to, to revisit as well or that we, we are uh, required to, to change. Um, the, the, from the searches, since I, I take it that the question is uh, global in scope, not necessarily Greece specific, um, in terms of uh, data, I do not have uh, uh, the specific numbers at hand, at least for Greece. Um, nevertheless, the, the examples that I shared from the, the networks of, for example, Agroxenia um, um, and uh, ecotourism in Greece are networks of uh, practitioners, so already existing businesses. Um, which uh, have responded to a new demand. Now, in terms of returns uh, on investment, I guess uh, it is, it's not necessarily um, uh, comparable to uh, conventional uh, tourism because the purpose and, and the aim is not the same. It is not for uh, quantitative growth. Uh, and thus the metrics also of uh, return on these kinds of investments change. If, if there were ways to measure the, the quality of impact that they have, uh, then possibly we'd get a, a clearer picture. And uh, as you will see towards the end of contributes, on a, on a much more global level, uh, we have um, big, uh, let's say, actors of, uh, again, uh, networks of uh, coalitions which um, have uh, taken a, a specific stand uh, also in terms of what it means for them economically to, to be making this transition uh, to a different kind of tourism. The, the Conscious Travel uh, Network, in which uh, I will be referring to towards the end, uh, has also developed a specific model around that. And, and it includes the, the economic dimension. So that might be something that's useful to refer to afterwards. Thank you, Sabina. Um, there is a question also by Yanni. 
It says it's uh, difficult sometimes for visitors to do the extra mile for them to understand the local context, local needs, etc. Unless someone asks or even better guides them to do so. Can they ask beforehand from the travel agencies, hotels to provide them with advice and local knowledge? Does it work in practice? Hmm. Well, that's again, uh, that's a difficult one, Annie, especially in terms of uh, location. Um, what uh, we have been able to see in terms of practices of um, tour operators and travel agencies, especially abroad, is that they currently have uh, the demand uh, by their clients uh, to, to travel differently, to travel with uh, another kind of impact. And thus they integrate as a marketing strategy as well, uh, the types of uh, positive effects that such a trip can have. Um, of course, again, here, maybe to uh, not generalize, I am talking about the, the actors that are committed and that have been sensitized in uh, responsible tourism, which uh, in terms of numbers could not represent the majority right now. Nevertheless, it is considerable and it is existing. So this is uh, more of a, a movement towards uh, and uh, tendencies which uh, are accompanied with uh, the, the relevant uh, factual observations. Um, we have statistics from uh, very conventional, let's say, uh, stakeholders from uh, booking to Google, uh, whereby um, travelers state at least uh, their intention, uh, their, is often a disjunction with practice uh, to, to be more uh, conscious about the way they travel. Thank you, Sabine. Um, I don't see any reaction about the, the network. Um, so I don't know if uh, anyone has any idea of such networks uh, existing in Greece, um, but in terms of the um, like the, the investment for the ecotourism sector, I just want to make a, an interesting note that I realized just yesterday having a different discussion, that the fact that there may be um, already existing uh, uh, tourism facilities, for example, that may not, not fit the landscape uh, very well, or um, the investors may have made choices that are not very environmentally friendly. When the tourism uh, starts to shift away from them, then the investors would like to create something new rather than try to take the existing and refurbish. And as a, as a trend, let's say, to go into the ecotourism sector, my personal opinion is that one should try to utilize existing facilities and try to refurbish those rather than um, abandon the previous ones, let's say, because they don't fit the, tourist, the tourism trend anymore and the narrative, and then go into a completely new investment somewhere else. Um, that does not mean again that this would be financially more <laughs> more profitable than refurbishing because you would have to buy the old uh, um, the old uh, business and refurbish and still use it. So the the fact of um, the comparison of profitability versus other measures, as you said, Sabina, is really really something to consider. And the global trend also for uh, impact investing is trying to bring investors beyond the actual return on investment to try to examine other types of parameters that they want to achieve through their investments beyond their profit. Of course, to be fair, if someone is talking about small investors, it's always more difficult. If you're a large investor, then you kind of have the possibility to look into other impact versus your profits. But when you're small, this is a very significant uh, issue for someone to start a business or not, or to continue being in business or not. So it's an issue that is quite uh, challenging. Definitely, scale is, is a, a matter here, but both in the, the positive side of uh, effects and of uh, potential impact. Okay, so um, if we don't have any more uh, questions right now, uh, either we go on a break or Sabine, we can continue with the first part of your presentation uh, before we go on a break and go into the, the local initiatives. Um, 
What do you think? I think we can go into the second part of your presentation and save the break for later. We're not tired yet. <laughs> so give it maybe another 10 minutes, something like that. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thus, um, maybe already for some of you, this uh, format of um, mitigate, measuring, mitigating, and uh, compensating usually or contributing as is preferred here is, uh, is familiar. Um, it should be in the sense that uh, it is a, a standard sort of uh, for formula already provided uh, by the um, United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. Um, and it is also the, the architecture around which we've uh, decided to build the um, digital tools uh, of the ATR project. This is why here I am uh, repeating them, but with a twist, <laughs> um, starting from the, the measuring uh, part. Typically, as was uh, heard before, we would um, think of measuring in terms of the, the quantitative impact that uh, could give us uh, our footprint measurements. Um, and indeed, this is something that not only is uh, uh, current practice, but uh, is increasingly being uh, regulated uh, in terms of uh, touristic businesses um, as an obligation. Uh, thus, for example, airline companies have to inform their uh, customers of their footprint. A number of uh, ISO regulations uh, require that as well. And <laughs> the funny chaotic side of it is that uh, no uniform and no, um, let's say, um, sufficiently contextual sensitive tools uh, have been developed in, in a European partnership uh, this becomes blatant immediately uh, when each uh, partner of the, the project cannot actually come up with uh, one footprint calculator. Nevertheless, a suggestion is for a Green Tripper, uh, if, if you don't know it already. It is uh, one of the ones we've identified as uh, very, um, let's say, uh, um, potent and also applicable to the different sectors of emissions. Um, yet measuring, as I said, with the different twist that uh, I would also want to, to give it is uh, on one side taking as well the, the measure of our impact, which uh, refers to the um, these tangible examples where effects of uh, climate change combined with over tourism. So the um, human induced uh, uh, impacts become visible and affect our everyday lives. In, it, it may be the case that currently we only see that from time to time. For example, in this occasion of a, a February storm uh, in Naxos, where we hopefully see uh, well enough in the picture, the, um, the soil essentially being um, watered down into the, the sea. A clear example of uh, erosion, but also an example of an extreme weather effect, uh, all of which are uh, the, the elements of uh, climate change that are predicted to be affecting our region uh, of uh, the Mediterranean all the more frequently and with all the more um, intensity. Which brings us to also an important element, I believe, in the measure of our vulnerability. It is not about measuring something uh, um, uh, that uh, is going to impact something external of us, but we can see ourselves also as uh, at risk. We may not be the risk for the environment, uh, but many predictive models at least uh, consider that we are at risk. Elena pointed out pointed it out uh, in her webinar on on the land that um, multiple studies of which I've only 
selected an examples, um, state that we're going towards semi-arid conditions for the cyclades with intensified drought conditions and uh, less precipitation, which has already prevailed. Um, so the, the shift is already underway and um, having a measure of uh, what it is that we will be facing all the more, uh, I believe is quite important when we, we step into these landscapes. Um, this might sound <laughs> very grave, uh, and, and it is for sure. It doesn't mean uh, nevertheless that uh, we will just uh, resign to our fate and uh, do nothing about it <laughs> because there is a lot that can be done and there is a lot that can give meaning also to, to our action. Um, I would want to start by reducing the harm, which is the, the mitigate part. Um, although from what already has been said, avoiding the harm uh, would be the very first step towards which an increased understanding hopefully can bring us and towards which hopefully all of the lessons learned um, through the, the knowledge shared of our previous uh, webinars, webinar presenters as well, if integrated well enough, uh, can, can make us know it, not go into the, the harm reduction strategies. Nevertheless, here are some of them. Uh, with uh, a very bright example from uh, the cycladic context being the work of uh, clean blue paras and common seas, which will be introduced in a, a few minutes, I guess, after the break. Right? And um, the um, remaining um, mitigation practices follow here the five sectors of activity that I referred to previously with um, what will be coming up also, uh, as I mentioned, within a year from now, um, as an online game that can help travelers from around Europe, and at least from the five uh, involved countries uh, which share their resources and um, help us travel better with practices in, in all these uh, five sectors, will be called the Climact. Until then, um, I have tried to uh, um, group together some useful, I believe, resources, uh, also in terms of their practical format to be shared, uh, a checklist from Make Travel Matter, the principles of the Future of Tourism Coalition, which uh, for those of you asking previously about um, existing actors, within, uh, let's say, the changing landscape of tourism. Under this um, coalition, again, you can find many of them from around the world, as well as the Good Travel Guide, uh, which gives some Greece-specific uh, examples as well. These are for the, the general, the overall um, good practices to which I can refer you to. Um, Maybe before going into the specific sections, Nasia, if uh, you feel as well, we could go for a small break. Um, I think I'd like to, I don't know if uh, people would like to go on a break. I think I'd like to also uh, hear the examples. I don't okay. know. Okay. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I think I we, can, we can completely finish this part uh, before the break then watch a small video to enter the cycladic landscape to the break and then go into the actual <laughs> cycladic context. Well, that, then possibly, okay, cut me Sounds if you good. think it's, uh, it's too long. There's quite a, a lot to it, that's why. <laughs> no, no, I think uh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, then for the, um, the first sector of transportation, um, which uh, admittedly, as we saw before, is... Uh, the number one in terms of uh, impact within the tourism sector. Um, in, again, in terms of uh, CO2 emissions and its uh, effect towards climate change, but also, of course, as we said before, with the socioeconomic uh, dimension attached to it. Uh, thus, choosing the where, the when, and the how of transportation is uh, crucial for any traveler. 
and um, some uh, recommendations around that, uh, trying to boil them down only to three main points, uh, would be, first of all, to, to consider exploring some of these uh, secret gems, for example, the lesser known places, which um, actually do not, uh, could say, suffer from uh, the um, uh, incredible numbers of uh, accumulated people. And in Greece, there are a lot of them. It's uh, it's equally um, an issue when, um, well, in all uh, many elements in nature, when um, a, a place is uh, overpopulated as when it is underpopulated. And thus, uh, if we are in this effort to strike again a balance, um, choosing, choosing the places of the beaten track is also a helpful action for them. It's not only reducing the harm, it is actually also helping the ones that are um, in undergrowth and uh, are missing out on all the action. Um, of course, choosing when to go there is equally crucial in terms of uh, condensation of people. Uh, the so-called shoulder seasons, which for Greece would be spring uh, before May, so March and April and uh, autumn, September, October and November. Uh, are also extremely pleasurable uh, months to, to travel uh, on these islands. And uh, the how of the travel with uh, the mobility pyramid, which uh, you may be able to, to see here, is extremely important as well, given that aviation, uh, as we, we saw previously, accounts for uh, the maximal emissions uh, in terms of CO2 and that um, also taking uh, alternative uh, modes of transport can give an entirely new experience to the traveling itself. Um, there is uh, currently also a tendency, especially in, uh, in our European partner countries to reinforce policies toward slower tourism with even uh, state measures announced uh, post COVID for um, in France for trips that are that can be done uh, within two and a half hours to not be serviced by airplanes. So some of these uh, legislations are, are also underway. Um, in, uh, in Greece, it is a, a much different reality, let's say. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, we can uh, consider it as a uh, an important uh, action to take when, uh, when we choose how we get to our destinations. And once we are there, choosing where to stay is, uh, is another really impactful um, selection. Now, when uh, we say, to, when we recommend opting for sustainable places, uh, definitely the, the horizon is vast under, under the word sustainable and um, despite the existence of uh, a number of different uh, certifications that uh, exist around that within the the greek context as well uh, we know very well that um, it's uh, it is extremely difficult to to have comparable measures with um, places where certificates uh, are awarded based on criteria that do not necessarily match the, the context of the small islands. Um, for, for this, again, step, um, it is hard, but the, the recommendation is to go the extra miles in, in doing research about it and uh, taking into account the, the understanding of a place and uh, its um, positioning um, ecologically, so socially, uh, and thereby making the, the adequate choice. We give a, a good practice here from existing in the cyclists and in the CPF uh, network of Tino Psychologe, quite unique in its kind, <laughs> and uh, nevertheless presenting a, a highlight of the best practice existing in, in, the, in the cyclists. Once in the accommodation, also uh, equally extremely important to 
not act also in ways that are uh, entirely different from uh, the the habits, the uh, sustainable habits that we may want to adopt once in our home place. Uh, the tendency is observed that uh, water consumption, for example, in showers, in hotels is, I uh, mm, don't remember the exact proportion, but uh, more than double uh, than, than what we do at home. And uh, a series of uh, small practic practicable habits can be found, uh, for example, in the linked here ecotourism uh, project. Again, another uh, Mediterranean environment, uh, Mediterranean Center of Environment, European project, uh, which equally addresses uh, travelers uh, who are looking for eco hosts and the hosts themselves. So actionable also by uh, accommodation providers. Plus, you have a, a small uh, quiz challenge, uh, which can be. Uh, taken with you, distributed uh, in a, an online or a, a flyer, which you can uh, through which you can also amplify your your echo and uh, disseminate the news. And of course, as uh, is known within the accommodation domain, leaving reviews about places uh, that, for example, practice uh, um, sustainable uh, methods of hosting can go a very long way. So on to the activities now, the, the sector of what it is that you, you do uh, once you are in a destination. Um, it is possible to go for lower impact activities and slow tourism. These would include activities that, for example, uh, do not entail any um, um, Make, make, um, machine uh, and um, um, heavy impact transportation, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, motorcycles, jet skis, uh, and other motorized means, uh, but rather a preference for, for example, experience-based walking tours, of which we'll be able to, to hear more about through finding Greece afterwards responsible fishing tours, uh, an echo which we will have from Santorini later on. More broadly here, activities that could honor the, the sense of place, um, something that matches the, the local environment, the cultural also setting in which one is found. These can allow for something that uh, the slow tourism trend um, uh, really puts forward as a different way of experiencing a place that is uh, more meaningful and where a more intimate connection is created between uh, a visitor and, and a, a place, a land. Also activities uh, that do not put in peril uh, those fragile and uh, sensitive environments in which we tread. Uh, with wildfires in Greece uh, and in the cyclists being a number one danger. For these, again, uh, as with uh, the various points touched upon, the, the accompanying um, uh, resource sheet that we will send you will have specific links uh, on also what is found in terms of the activities in Greece and the cyclists as much as possible, as much as has been um uh, recorded up until now and um yes let's go into the 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 fourth of these sectors uh, and uh, close to to final the the food domain in terms of um global emissions again is uh, uh at the top place, it it also it even exceeds uh, energy and transportation uh, combined, which means that uh, not only when visiting, but of course more, much more broadly, uh, attention to the the kind of uh, nutrition that we have is uh, crucial if we want to take care of our effect on the planet. And um, one, I guess, of the the latest uh, new trends and 
uh, another uh, Aryan uh, nutrition um, tendency is the climate Aryan. You may have heard of it already. The, um, it is also a global movement, and the, the main elements, main ingredients of it are on the top list avoiding the most impactful uh, food categories, which are beef and lamb. Also, of course, combined with um, an awareness of what we call the, the bioregion, so what it is that grows locally, what it is that grows seasonally, and uh, also, hopefully, in the places that uh, we were able to find them organically as well, which in the cyclists can be a very, very interesting and, uh, mm, let's say, uh, <laughs> surprising way to, to meet interesting people who, who have either uh, kept some traditions in terms of cultivating the land or are renewing ways uh, of uh, taking care of the earth, including permaculture, agroforestry, and we do find such initiatives also in the cyclades, uh, which is quite encouraging. <laughs> and the final point uh, I would have to, to make around uh, food, of course, in, in all its um, uh, different uh, dispositions is, uh, is the avoidance of waste, not only of food waste, but also of the packaging that comes with that. And I believe that we will be hearing much more about it from Clean Blue and, and the various practices it has uh, put in place to, to avoid that. Mm, this is uh, enough, I guess, for, for this uh, section right now. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. Um, while you were presenting for us, um, people wanted to know the website of ECHO and the participants shared with each um, other. Uh, Vicky, nice to have you again with us. We haven't met, but you've been following all our webinars and uh, we very much appreciate that. You're always very, very active. Um, I don't know if there are any questions that someone would like to post on the chat. Uh, for Sabine right now. Otherwise, we can watch a two-minute video, go on a short break, and uh, come back in a few minutes. Maybe take a short break. Five minutes should be should be enough, I think. So I'll be sharing a short video, and then we're off to a break. Thank you. Στα νησιά, στα νησιά. Ήταν το σύνθημα της νεανικής μου ζωής. Του να πλέεις πάνω σε ένα κομμάτι της ταιριάς, διαρκώς μέσα στη θάλασσα. Κυκλάδες is cooperation and care. Κυκλάδες is unique. Rough and blue. Cyclades is amazing. It's one of the most loved places of God. The Cyclades is my home. Home. Cyclades is power. Cyclades is beauty. Cyclades is diversity. Cyclades is colors. We all love Cyclades. That's all. Well, thank you. Let's take a five minute break and be back at uh, quarter past five. Thanks everyone.
Welcome back, everyone. There are a couple of uh, comments on the chat, but I think we can save those for a little bit later if people are okay with it, because we have a quite tight uh, schedule, even though we changed the break sequence. So we'll save that for afterwards. We will be going now into the local initiatives. We will be presenting the Clean Blue Paris Initiative of Common Seas. As you saw in the presentation notes, today with us was going to be Zanna Kodomanoli uh, to present these activities. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it to this live event. Um, so Zanna would guide us through choices each of us can make to break the plastic wave on Paris and beyond, sharing lessons from the pioneer project radically reducing plastic on the island of Paros, working with diverse stakeholders through a systemic approach to make long-term change. The Clean Blue Paris experiences suggestions are valuable both for visitors and for Horeca businesses. So to not miss this opportunity today to present the initiative, um, we have agreed with Zana that Dorothy Filiotis, our project manager and coordinator of the Green Volunteers in the Cycladis pro uh, program, will present the initiative instead of Zana. Uh, Dorothy is currently a collaborate, uh, collaborator of us of the Cycladis Preservation Fund. However, she was previously engaged with the Clean Blue Paris campaigns, so she knows firsthand the successes of the program. She will guide us through their efforts, and we will also try to address any questions you may have. In case there are any questions that we cannot answer, we'd like to kindly ask you to send us an email after the webinar so we can forward to the current Clean Blue Paris team. So Dorothy, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for offering to present on Zana's behalf, and please share her slides uh, and begin with the presentation of the Clean Blue Paris. Thank you. Thanks, Nasia. Okay, let me share my slides. Well, Zana's slides technically. Let's see, we'll go full screen. Let me know if this is looking okay. Okay, great. Yes, it's good, thank you. Yeah, so I was uh, formerly project uh, and research um, officer for Clean Blue Paros. Um, and uh, big thanks to Zana for offering this presentation uh, that I will try to do justice to this really like formidable uh, program as we will see. Um, yeah, so a little preamble, as we all know, plastic pollution, well, we may all know is at a critical levels at this point. Um, and according to recent findings by Common Seas, who is one of the initiators of the Clean Blue Bottles project, um, it's not limited to the external environment. In fact, eight in 10 people who took part in their recent research uh, found that there is plastic in their blood. Uh, and there is a general consensus towards finding solutions that address the root of the problem of plastic and negative consequences However, global progress in implementing systemic change is, uh, is limited. And here we come to Clean Blue Paros, which uh, is implemented by Common Seas, Paros Municipality, VAT, um, and local, local businesses and also external collaborators, such as uh, uh, CPF, the Cyclades Preservation Fund. And the aim is to make Paros the first single-use plastic-free uh, Mediterranean island. So the Clean Blue Alliance uses this systemic change uh, methodology um, invest to investigate, intervene, and influence, uh, analyzing the problem, forming partnerships with stakeholders, uh, devising and implementing interventions, and then uh, taking them to scale. So these are their, their methodology. And it do, does this using locations that are considered living system laboratories to test this sy systemic change methodology. Uh, and they pick their locations based on them having a kind of plastic waste uh, problem and also having an opportunity. So Paros as like a Greek example, and, and in Greece in general, um, they have Greece has a plastic waste issue 
regarding the sea where one kilogram of plastic waste per person enters the sea every year. And that's compared to an EU average of 0 0.03 kilograms. And uh, Pato specifically sees a 5,000% increase in plastic waste during high season. So big problem there. And the opportunity is that the municipality showed a lot of eagerness to act on recommendations from the research of, of uh, common seas. So this gave life to this uh, program, which has been uh, running since, uh, I want to say, late 2018, early 2019. So to solve a problem, first, we must understand it. And this is the investigate, the first wave of the methodology. And this includes uh, ongoing, but uh, mostly in the more so in the beginning of the project, these audits. The waste audit analyzed the entire waste system essentially to see uh, where the flows are and what's going to landfill, what's going where. Marine audits uh, surveyed coastlines, four beaches, four times a year to see seasonality, what ends up on the beaches. Um, and what is the mix of that waste? So we see some uh, findings from that to do with cigarette butts and, and especially plastic waste. And the social audit uh, was about um, understanding how people use plastic and what uh, inspires them and also or, or inhibits them from making changes. And from the learnings that they got from investigating that informs the interventions that they make. So the findings about cigarette butts led to this collaboration with the GOPA project uh, with these voting ashtrays, uh, 17 in, in kind of specific locations like beaches and ports. So we, we see that this did have a significant impact. And through observing a kind of mistrust and misunderstanding of the recycling system, uh, an informative campaign paired with this sticker pilot program on something like 330 bins uh, led to a big impact in uh, taking what would have gone to landfill to go to uh, recycling instead. Um, oh, my page isn't changing. Okay, so other interventions include uh, one plate 10 summers, which is a set of reusable dishes which have been used in uh, kind of local celebrations and events, uh, leading to 8,000 single use plate cuts and cups and cutlery avoided, and, or, and also the tote bag making workshops where reused um, fabrics were made into tote bags to also avoid you know, single use uh, plastic bags. Uh, and some even kind of deeper, more systemic work with local stakeholders includes the business engagement project supporting businesses who were not very informed or supported in the EU bans for single use plastic and uh, clean blue baros uh, gives them tools, guidelines, for reducing their plastic and they commit to that through uh, the big business engagement um, part of the project. And um, through the social audits, they learned that uh, residents, especially residents and through their interaction with visitors, they mistrusted tap water and would inform visitors that it's not drinkable, even though the tap water is drinkable um, the water company adheres to all EU and national regulations. All the tests are within good um, limits and a informative campaign informed, uh, sent out leaflets and, and so on, informing visitors and residents about the drinkability of tap water. And uh, then in education, um, the toolkits have been shared to many schools to help children understand and become investigators themselves about plastic uh, as an issue. And following that into the influence wave, 
is uh, scaling and and sharing kind of the findings and the methodologies after they've been worked. Uh, so sharing them further, and this includes um, supporting the tourism industry because the Ministry of Tourism has set this goal of reducing plastic, uh, single-use plastic by 50%. So Common Seas uh, has a tool that can help monitor, uh, adapt interventions, and um, and so on in the plastic industry. Uh, other, the Drink Tap campaign can also support other also government mandated um, implementations of providing drinkable tap water in different locations. Plastic Academy has been uh, approved by the Ministry of Education and can be fitted into the Greek um, school uh, the word is, is escaping me, but the, this is ready to be shared in schools throughout the country. And finally, the Clean Blue Paros has packaged up the findings from uh, Clean Blue po Promise, sorry, has packaged up the findings and the methodologies from Clean Blue Paros, and municipalities can commit to reducing plastic pollution and have the support and resources from common seas to implement this in their own context. So that's a really brief overview of Clean Blue Paros and Common Seas work. And uh, I encourage you to go into the Clean Blue Paros uh, website. I will actually, oh, I didn't put it here, but I'll send, I'll send that around. As you know, I sent whoever's been to these webinars, I sent follow-up notes. Um, and I think that's it from me. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. That was uh, really lovely for those uh, that joined now during Dorothy's presentation. Uh, Dorothy presented on behalf of the Common Seas team, the Clean Blue Paris Initiative. Uh, so there is a question in the chat uh, from Christina Archer. Curious to know how, if there is info nationally on where the tap water is drinkable, or can we assume this is across all Greece? Um, I can take this one and then Dorothy, you can complement if you'd like. It's not drinkable across Greece. Uh, people would have to check with the local municipality because local municipalities are, are typically responsible for the drinking water supply. In some municipalities, there's a dedicated municipal enterprise that's responsible for water, but asking the municipality will address you to whoever is responsible for the water supply system in your area. Uh, Dorothy, if you want to. And, yeah, there on. is. I found in Zana's notes um, that there is a mandate from the government for sports facilities and playgrounds to provide drinkable water. So that's uh, that's a mandate from the government. OK, thanks. Um, but slide. generally in Greece, water is um, drinkable in a high percentage of the country population wise compared to other European states even. So do ask around. Islands can be trickier, but there are some islands with drinkable water as well. It may be specific uh, parts of the island that have drinkable water as well. Not all systems are, uh, are united. Um, there's also another question by Vicky. I also wanted to ask if eventually recycling works properly in Greece, meaning that they don't throw recycling objects in the trash and the end of the line. Excuse me if I don't use the right words about the topic. Um, I don't know, Dorothy, if you want to say something or I, I could. Uh, I, I will say at least we we couldn't generalize, but in Paros specifically, I think it might be location specific, like Paros has a recycling sorting center and works with VAT as a recycling uh, company in Attica. So uh, they work directly together, but it might be different in different areas. Yes, so thanks, Dorothy. Uh, again, this is diverse across Cyclades and across the country. Uh, the islands would typically need to sort, as Dorothy say, and export their recycling uh, material outside the island, either to some other island that has larger facilities or to mainland Greece. And in mainland Greece, again, it depends on the area, what the management of waste is. There are local uh, recycling plants, let's say, 
uh, rather management of recyclables. I would say that's more accurate. Again, one should um, explore with the municipality. There have been, um, let's say, citizens that have claimed that the recyclables don't go where they should go. So no one can really know, according to what municipality, what happens. But my personal opinion is that we should keep uh, putting recyclables in the recycled bins. This uh, forces also uh, the people responsible for recycling to take action because recyclable waste is visible. Uh, common waste is not visible. It goes and it's uh, dumped in, <laughs> in um, anyhow, we call them hita or hiti in Greek. Uh, we would call them dump dumpsters in English maybe. Uh, they are buried essentially. So buried waste is invisible waste. Recyclable waste is more visible. So I would always advise to put it in the recycle bin and um, more information unfortunately can be given by municipalities or by local NGOs. Uh, sometimes they know a lot what happens and they also collaborate with municipalities on these issues, trying to facilitate better uh, waste management. Um, ah, Annie comments, proud for the CPF to have supported Clean Blue Paris in business engagement part of this initiative. Indeed, we were one of the first supporters of the Clean Blue Paris when they started um, their uh, activities on the island. Uh, Madeline says, in Athens, we have one of the best tap water in Europe. <laughs> I agree. Um, living in Athens myself, I'm very strict about never drinking bottled water. And I will go back to the comments about the restaurants that were addressed to Sabine, but I think they fit nicely now. Um, because in many cases, we would ask for drinkable water as consumers uh, in Athens or on the islands or in other areas of Greece, but even the restaurants themselves would not know that the water tab is drinkable and you would have to ask two or three times and convince them that yes, please bring me a jar, I don't want the bottled water. So the comment before was from Panayotis. Thank you, Sabina, for your presentation. I think also by not buying glass bottled water for consumption will really improve the situation on island without drinkable water. Pet bottles is a huge waste and refilling your own bottle is not something you can do everywhere. And then Marozina responds true, but glass bottles are not really available for retail buyers on small islands. And don't make me tell what restaurants that offer glass bottles only as a greenwashing strategy do with them when the restaurant closes at night. And Panayotis responds, I know better than plastic though. So bottled water that comes in plastic bottles or a bottled water that comes in glass, there is a difference. I don't know, Doris, if you also want to comment on this. Drinkable water from the tub and using a jar would always be the best, the best choice. And checking with the local authorities if it's drinkable or not and demanding, let's say, of the restaurant that you're going to or the cafe to serve you in a jar rather than offer you bottled water would be a, my, my, my proposed way of, uh, of acting. If I may add also Nasia here. Yes, please. And, Abina, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure if maybe Maria from Amorgos can also add up to that. Uh, the cyclists are also lucky enough to have uh, natural spring sources, even though many of us don't know about that. And um, there's currently underway an effort to map them for Amorgos, right, Maria? So that's also something to, to keep in mind and to possibly orient uh, ourselves towards in terms of uh, uh, making as well the, the necessary controls uh, for their quality, but just remembering, you know, the natural resource. Maybe the natural resources is not enough for the, all the population, and especially in the, during the summer. But uh, also the tap water, now that they have changed the pipes and they make a new system, it's not bad, it's good. You can, I drink it, for example. And also there are um, three or four, uh, maybe more uh, points of uh, the MAC machines that they have filtered water that you can fill your bottle with uh, maybe 10 cents per liter. So you can... Um, take the water, drinkable your place and everything. Thank you, Maria. Um, because we have Eleni Scarvelli with us, uh, she's uh, connecting through London and we have a tight schedule. I'd like to continue this discussion later in the final discussion. And also, Uli, if you're going to be with us again in the end, 
uh, also share your experience from Klingley Nandros and your uh, uh, effort to promote spring water as an alternative for uh, avoiding <laughs> um, bottled water. So Eleni, are you here? Would you like to open your screen or you're going to be speaking without, uh, without the screen? Just let us know and then I will in be introducing you. Is uh, Eleni with us? Can you hear me now? Yes. You. And you oh. can see me, right. Yes, hi. Hi, Eleni. Awesome. Uh, Hello. Uh, Perfect. So Dorothy will be sharing your, your slides because you're on the mobile. I will be introducing you first. Yes. Uh, so uh, Elen Scarvelli from the Greek National Tourism Organization, GNTO, UK and Ireland, and the Sustainable Greece Platform. Director of the GNTO UK, Eleni, will invite us to explore the Sustainable Greece platform created to highlight and promote the many sustainable initiatives that one can find across Greece with the aim of encouraging British travelers to visit and explore Greece in a way that benefits and enhances local communities and natural beauty. The Sustainable Greece platform hosts a variety of inspirational stories from across the country. Some of these are also from our lovely Cyclades. And we have tried the CPF also to contribute with what we know is happening on the field. And these stories of the Sustainable Greece platform demonstrate how Greece is looking to embrace the challenges of the future through a sustainable transformation of its tourism uh, sector. So Eleni, thank you for being uh, with us and uh, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Nasia. It's, um, it's, it's really nice to be with you today, although I have to apologize that um, uh, it, it is a very uh, difficult uh, moment. I'm in a, in a General Assembly of AITO, uh, that is the association of the travel agents, the tour operators, the small and niche uh, tour operators, uh, but um, I, I wouldn't miss uh, today's webinar because I think it's a, a, an excellent way in the work that you're doing. But I have to say in your initial remark that it was a challenge for us, uh, our collaboration with you, because I had if we were going to create sustainable Greece, I would have to transform it to CPF as sustainable Greece. Uh, most of the initiatives that they were out there, they were all amazing. And of course, um, we wanted to include them uh, uh, to our platform, uh, but we had to cherry pick in order to, to keep the balance. And that's only the only reason why we don't have all the initiatives um, in our uh, platform. But let's start from the beginning. Uh, the reason of uh, the creation of uh, sustainable Greece, uh, and as my my presentation does not really have a, a, a specific flow, Dorothy is uh, is fine with you to change the the slide whenever you want, and I will just continue talking. Um, so the the idea of the sustainable Greece started when I just arrived in our office in London uh, about a, a year ago almost a year ago um, and I participated to a conference in, uh, in in one of the travel weekly conferences where everybody was talking about sustainability and the sustainable initiatives that they were taking so uh, our dear uh, competitor uh, and uh, at the same time, of course, a colleague from uh, Spain was there to announce and say all the great things that they were doing. And at that moment, I just realized that, OK, there must be ways, there must be things that we are doing in our country. Just probably I, I, I don't know about them. So I started looking, I started talking to people, I started uh, researching. And I found out that there were amazing things happening in my own country. And I'm really ashamed to say, though, because theoretically 20 years in the organization and 10 yes. years abroad, I should know about it. Yeah. But, but, but I, I, I didn't. So um, the, uh, the, the initiative started, uh, the initiative started uh, in order to have all the ideas and everything that is happening in Greece. 
Um, we we wanted to see uh, how that will be possible uh, to make it attractive to the to the people, but at the same time to the trade. So our sustainablegreece.co.uk platform has exactly that role. It attracts um, visitors from the British market, uh, but at the same time, uh, it creates a hub for trade for travel agents and tour operators that they are uh, willing to include these initiatives and these experiences in their packages. And at the same time, I have to say, we've managed to uh, get across with a lot of um, partners uh, in Greece, uh, with a lot of companies, uh, with a lot of uh, even British tour operators that they're already doing that. And I think into, into this trip that how I met um, Annie and the Cycladic Preservation Fund and the excellent work that you've been doing. So having that as a role, uh, a dual role, uh, trying to motivate other Greeks to be part of this platform with uh, sustainable initiatives, but at the same time to inform the British public, but also the British trade, we wanted to have a, a general overview. So we wanted to have the, the, the projects, the, the future projects that they're going to be. In that case, for example, is uh, like Roads Collab, a collaboration that has been happening with uh, TUI, a, a big tour operator, and of course, the, the, the government and the, the region of South Aegean. And in that case, it shows really how the private sector with the uh, public sector, they can really work together into a very good common role to transform the island into a green island. This is, of course, a long process. Uh, it will take some time to uh, to continue and, and doing that. But um, we are sure that at the end, the results will be great. So apart from the future projects, which is, of course, a, a whole list of uh, other uh, future projects that are happening at the moment, it's also, of course, the best practices, some ideas that we feel that it's, it's really worth talking about. And as uh, Dorothy mentioned before, Paros is uh, one of those uh, with a plastic uh, project that has been uh, an MOU signed with the Ministry of tourism try again to motivate uh, travel agents and uh, uh, and tour operators and hotels to minimize the, the plastic waste. Um, hopefully this is not just going to be on papers but this is will be in practice. I think for the first time we see a very a, a great momentum a, a great timing uh, for the uh, for the hoteliers, for, for the whole uh, tourism industry that they want to participate to something like that. So it's really, really encouraging. And at the same time, there are initiatives uh, like the ones of uh, the, um, the Cycladic Preservation in front of CPF that they're doing some excellent work. Um, it's, uh, it's always funny because I start with my favorite one in wherever I am, in whatever four-hour conference I participate, um, I always start with the women, the, the super women, the super women and the, yes, the, the wonder women, that's how we call them in our website, the wonder women that they they, they with very sim simple way uh, they just put out the idea of sustainability um the the website and the initiatives they're there i don't want to present you something very very specific because i think everyone who's interested can go very easily uh, uh, go there and and find out the ideas what i would really wanted to stress out and this is something that is coming up with a lot of discussions uh, when we are around in the industry is that um, the travel agents and uh, people they're overwhelmed by the word of sustainability the marketeers, on the other hand, they feel that it's it's a sort of like, you know, a, a marketing trendy word tag that everyone needs to add in their storytelling. We feel that uh, it should be something in the middle. We feel that it, it shouldn't be overwhelming and um, uh, fear and stress the, 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 the travel agents to talk about it. But at the same time, it shouldn't be used for greenwashing. It should be used in vain and uh, cause greenwashing because this is exactly the opposite effect that we want to create. 
Um, so starting with simple things, starting with simple ideas, which of course there's a lot of work behind it and the amazing work that uh, CPF is doing, but it's very important from our side to put it out there. Um, and why it is important to be connected. For example, the, uh, the, the future project that's going to take place in, in, in Syros. Uh, it is important to, to mention it, to know people that we are working on that. Maybe it's not 100% there ready. Maybe it's something that it's still um, in paper and there still needs some time to, to, to take to become reality but the important is that it is sensible um the, the we all feel that it should be a great uh initiative when it's uh, finalized and the importance is um how you can uh engage the traveler to be part of that uh, so that's the idea of the sustainable platform, sustainable Chris platform. The idea is to uh, talk to um, uh, to the public, uh, talk to the to the people, talk to the traveler, the future traveler coming to Greece, that um, these destinations they're working on something else. It's not just a, a beautiful windmill or just a beautiful sea and sun or there, there are more to it. And in order to do that, we are definitely need to talk more and more in every occasion about all these great initiatives that they're happening. Um, a part, of course, of the, 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 the initiatives of CPF uh, and uh, that they're on the website and, of course, the, the, the Ionian Foundation that, uh, again, we, we cherry picked, as I said before, some of the, these initiatives that are there. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that people understand that simple things when we're talking about social sustainability, like the, the mastic trace of heels, this is really something uh, unique. And uh, the importance to say that this is part of all the things that we want to pass to the traveler. Uh, we are making a, a special effort uh, to keep culture. And culture is not necessarily our uh, great archaeological sites or uh, uh, ancient sites or the museums, but it's also that that is becoming from the people. And when we see the initiatives that they're coming from CPF, this is, to be honest, that this is the moment that we feel very proud because these people are taking very seriously the work and they, they're going um, a step further. This is um, the, the alien, the Pick the Alien initiative that the CPF and the Union Foundation have in, in a lot of their islands. Um, it is one of the initiatives that I think it's definitely strikes out in every conference where I'm talking. Um, Pick the Alien, everybody thinks that it's uh, uh, something that it has to do with the space and not about uh, fishing and, of course, the, uh, the, the, the initiative to educate not only the fishermen to pick the strange fish but also uh, to pick the uh, for the for the restaurateurs to to include it in their menu but also for the travelers to cho to choose it to make the right choice from uh, their um for their dish so this uh, it's a lot of people that it's a, a big cycle and a vicious cycle that uh, for people it's not enough only one part. Everyone has to do its own part. Everyone has to share uh, it, its own contribution on something like that. Most of these projects are, are simply amazing. It's just people don't know it and that's why we feel that we need to be dedicated on this uh, to create it so we are uh, in our next uh, marketing campaign that we are starting now for 2023 uh, a lot of our uh, marketing actions that will take place they're going to be involved with uh, uh, sustainable initiatives uh, promoting our destinations through the eyes of uh, great environmental initiatives that they're doing good not only for the local communities but of course for uh, for the traveler as well um if i if i still have uh, one minute i just wanted to to finish uh, with um a uh, very quick uh video if we have the possibility to show it uh which just uh, it's just an idea of all the um the initiatives that they're 
are on on the website on the platform and again the platform as i said it it is a tool that we're using uh to go further uh, a tool uh to just uh, have the possibility um to um integrate into our uh everyday life and 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 make it a, a reality because to be honest this is what is uh, all about do we have the possibility for the video i don't know dorothy i don't know if we have a a video it, oh it was at the end of the slide okay ah, that's that, that that's fine it will play yes but that's fine that, that that's not a problem uh, I, I, yes, this is the one. No, it's. I does it work? I don't know. No, that's fine. No worries. Technically. No, 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 no worries. No worries. That that that's not a problem. It was just a, a really showing in a very uh, quickly a, a quick way um, about the platform. But uh, I think the um, anyone, as I said before, can visit the web the the website. Uh, and what is more important for us is to have more initiatives there uh, to multiply these initiatives. We have at the moment 44 uh, experiences, initiatives, uh, uh, posts uh, that they are there. So we would love to, to make it 100. And we would love to discover more things that are happening in, in, in Greece. And uh, we are proud to promote it. Thank you very much, Eleni. Uh, because we know you have a short uh, time frame, I'd like to invite anyone who has a question for you to post it on the chat so that we can ask you now directly. And if you have a YouTube link to the video you mentioned, we can play it right before our next break, even though you won't be here. I don't know if it's available online since it's not loading in the presentation. Um, not really. We we are trying to create as a country, as, as, as a Greek national tourism organization, a video that it will have our sustainable initiatives. And I think that it's uh, what is important. Hopefully next year, that time, we'll have a webinar with a video on that. Uh, but at that moment, it was a very short video, just really very quickly showing all the initiatives that are on the website. It's, it's not really important. It it's, doesn't really make a difference. It's it's always nice to have a video and animation uh, when we are uh, presenting. Okay, sorry. Yes, I also opened it in the background while we were speaking to Dorothy. Unfortunately, it's not loading. Maybe it's, a, it's an MP3 that needed to uh, go along, uh, but it didn't. Uh, so I don't know if you already mentioned, um, I understand there will be more information coming on the platform soon. So it's a wealth of information already but um, maybe right before the summer one can go into the, <laughs> the platform again to see even more. Exactly. And that's, that's, as I said, this is our goal. We want to have more information on the platform. We really feel that there are a lot of things out there that are happening, uh, a, a lot of initiatives. Maybe sometimes, you know, people feel, oh, why? That, this is not important. This is something simple, just cleaning the... Um, you know, the beach or uh, uh, so many beautiful things that are happening, but believe me, or, or, or the water or saving water with simple things that we're doing. I know it's so funny sometimes we have a lot of hotels now that the very uh, environmental policy about the, the water and the, and the towels and things like that. We, in some of our islands, we've been doing that for years now, trying to save um, the waste of water. And I know that a lot of hotels also, they're trying very hard with the waste of, um, of uh, the management of the waste. It, it is difficult to talk about zero waste. And, and this is the discussion right now. I know that we are still discussing about recycling and things like that. But um, it, it doesn't matter. We shouldn't be intimidated by all these kind of things. I think everyone should continue the work and what we are doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm very positive that at the end, we will get there. Thank you, Eleni. Um, so there are a couple of comments not uh, related to your presentation. And then there's a question for you by Philip um, asking, when you select initiatives to profile on your website, 
how do you decipher between truly sustainable initiatives and those of a more greenwashing nature? Uh, greenwashing is an, is an issue widely discussed. So it is indeed indeed uh, Nasha. We uh, we try to talk with all the partners, and that that's the whole idea. First of all, to say that it it exists. It's not something that we found on the internet. Uh, we we try to see the work. Uh, I have to say that Annie also has been playing my advisor <laughs> since uh, the first moment that we uh, met her and, and we discussed because it, this is a field that is completely new to us. We are not the sustainable experts. We are not sustainable guru. We, we, we're just trying to promote the things that they've been doing, that have been happening. So we were discussing and we are a, a lot of times uh, discuss a lot with the partners and also with the local community as well. So to avoid uh, uh, initiatives that they might have been very good for one year, but not happening at the moment. And again, uh, when it comes to brainwashing, uh, there is some things that they were uh, maybe happening in the past uh, and maybe not right now. They might be a little bit, let's say, down. But again, because the idea is to share the ideas, um, uh, our goal is to, if I am doing something great, I want the others to find it out. And this is, we're not doing it only in a national level, but we're doing it in an international level as well. So the idea is, if Annie has a great idea, CPF is working on something amazing, uh, why don't we, can we go and copy that and, and do it in another destination, in another island, that it will again bring this knowledge and, uh, and, and create more, multi, uh, create multipliers for a sustainable living. So uh, I, I think everything helps. But so far, to be honest, I haven't, uh, haven't been through to um, uh, a case that it has been uh, greenwashed. Thank you, Lenny. Um, Marozina has uh, raised her hand also to have a question. Because we have a short time frame. Yes, please go ahead, Marozina, even though at this time we... Uh, yeah. We encourage Hello. questions at the chat, but because Eleni has to go, please go ahead speaking to us. Okay, I have a question for her. First of all, thank you very much. Can you hear me properly? Yes. yes. I had a, a chance to look through the website while you were speaking. And what, I, what seems to be missing is any advice on people who want to visit Greece in a sustainable way, since we are here in a webinar about eco-visitors. So you are showing all the sustainable initiatives and experiences and activities, but there is, at this point at least, nowhere where you can be advised on how to make sustainable choices coming. For example, because I've lived it's, in- uh, Sorry, sorry, to, Mara. It's the, last, it's the last section. You probably ah. didn't go through the whole website. It's the last okay. section which is called sustainable holidays. And those are the holidays. And I think that is also something innovative from our side. We've asked uh, tour operators and the hotel partners, those that they have already some ideas about how they can be, they've been doing it. So there are tour operators that are already offering uh, holidays in a sustainable way, or uh, like Sanville, for example, that they're doing, you can visit Greece uh, by train or uh, have um, an excursion with dolphins or uh, following uh, different things uh, uh, that, and that is the section that we encourage the trade to participate. So uh, we are open to uh, any tour operator or travel or DMC who has a, a very specific idea and they would like to be included to take them and put them in that section of holidays. But I was not, thank you so much for your answer. I was not referring to that. I was referring to advice on how an individual, regardless of if they're, if they're going to go on, on that type of, of, uh, of an experience, for vacation, how can they be respectful of the small islands and the communities and be an eco-visitor? Because I've lived in the UK and I see people, and I'm saying this because I do frequent an island for many months every summer, the same island, and I see a lot of people who, when they're home, when they're in the cities, 
and go around with their usable cups because small businesses promote it and chain cafes promote it and everything. But when they get to Greece, there is no reusable cup. And I know that's the bare minimum, but waste in the small islands is a huge problem. So, yes, I see I would, what I you mean. I would love if I could see a section yeah. there on how, apart from having the, the eco experience, yeah. the islands, how can you bring your eco habits with you so you can be respectful of these communities and, and, yeah. and help continue the initiatives? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mara. And this is a really a very nice idea, but this is that was not the goal of, uh, of our platform. The goal of the platform was really to inspire and uh, give the ideas about the traveler where to pick to go for the holidays and how they will go. Um, about educating the public, you're absolutely right. I totally agree, but I think there should be a different initiative and a different project maybe, or a training or something else that we can talk about it because it is indeed something that we also see in a lot of, uh, in different research um, and in different surveys that, as you said, the people that they're very sustainable or very conscious in their own countries and when they're going on holidays because they feel no matter where not only in greece i think this is general they feel that they because they deserve it because they're in a luxury way or because they're out of their home they have the, the right to to feel in a different way so that's why um that it it goes with the education and i think a lot of times that it it, it needs a a bit a, a, a bigger change if you want to say to the societies and to the ways that uh, uh people are feeling and reacting when they're visiting but i think in order to be a positive because always a, a positive person uh, the the most important thing is that People are now becoming more conscious and people are thinking about this twice. Um, and uh, if you give them the right environment and if you make the right suggestions, uh, they will follow. There will always be somewhere, uh, some, some, some of them that they might never follow. But you cannot address to that. You will always have to address to the positive um, ones that they're ready to, to embrace that. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you, Maro. Uh, so, Maro, what we're doing today is, is that. So, in the series of our four webinars, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't remember if uh, you were in any of the previous webinars as well. Um, this is the fourth one that addresses uh, visit short, uh, short stay visitors, let's say. So, what Sabine presented before and what we'll be introducing also uh, in her next uh, presentation slot after the break is about this and the pillars that Sabina showed later, how you can reduce your impact through transport, uh, accommodation, your choices in vendors, um, how you can in general approach in a way that will be more friendly to the social environment and the, envir and the natural environment of the place you visit is what we're trying to introduce today. And the reason why we are recording also um, this webinar is to widely try to spread this also to people that were not able to join today. And in fact, we had uh, more than 170 registered participants and the participants now know that there will be a recording. So some of them may have actually registered to have access to the recording afterwards, even though they couldn't join us today. At least this is what we hope because many of them enrolled in the last three or four days. So they must have known from their schedule that they wouldn't be here with us today, but we're still interested to learn. And Dorothy will also be making some pocket actions uh, following up each webinar. She puts the main, um, the main messages, let's say, of uh, actions, what to do. It's of each of us participating in the webinars, what we can do. And some of this will address the issues that you're also, that you're also discussing. And uh, I agree with you as well. <laughs> People have, uh, like they have their, their own um, customs, let's say, and, uses are this initiasmas in our everyday life and then we go on vacation and suddenly we do yep. something else we become a different person it's as if our mind forces us to work in one way when we are in our everyday life and then we go on vacation we suddenly become someone else this does not make sense i agree with you completely uh, it's not that we should respect more the place where we have our permanent residence and less the place where we visit for vacation and this is one of the main problems actually so very spot on uh, observation. 
Um, there are also some, some comments. Um, Vicky suggests maybe the Sustainable Greece platform could just have some links to some of the how to be a responsible traveler that were presented earlier this afternoon. And she shows also <laughs> several links, Eleni, that uh, you could refer to. Uh, Dorothy yes, also the, shares the, the sustainability yeah, the, the, the idea is to have a, um, a link connection with every post. So uh, it's, it's uh, and we have to keep in mind that it's not a website. If I said a website a couple of times, it's just because it was a mistake. This is uh, really the idea is to be a light box. And the light box in the technical world means that that where a marketing campaign will, will go and fit. So the idea is that we don't want to take the place of CPF or all the other great initiatives that are happening. We just want to highlight and address them to you. So this is our role. So we don't want to uh, put a lot of information on a platform that uh, you're already having and all these great things that you're already suggesting to the public, but we want to pick their attention and forward them to the right website. And I think that it's uh, what is important, but we can definitely put links and I think that it's um, interesting. And if you have any suggestions about initiatives or things that are happening in local communities that they're not in the website, we definitely would like to uh, include them in the platform. Yes, and we will also be launching these follow-up actions that we sent after each webinar. They are part of our, the Green Volunteers website that is being uh, revamped, is this the right word? It's being uh, refurbished <laughs> anyhow, with new material in this phase two. And uh, the, the idea is to act as a hub of information about what is discussed in these webinars for someone to have reference to easy to do uh, pocket actions, as Dorothy calls them, how to be more a uh, responsible traveler, more responsible uh, seasonal resident, um, more responsible citizen. So all these across our four webinars are discussed and all this information will be available to our website. Um, so I think... Um, Yes, Madeline says the consumer education is half part of the solution. She's in Greece, especially in the tourism industry, we're actually more market driven. And a funding idea, let's discuss this later, uh, later, Pierre. So when it I involves like aeroplanes to... and the CO2 emissions, I think yes. that, <laughs> that yes, the discussion exactly. is stopped. <laughs> we stopped the discussion at the moment because it is really um, one of the discussions with the CO2 emissions that it's it's been really dealing with a lot. Uh, with all the with all the tourism industry, from one hand, of course, you want development. You wouldn't be able to have development without the aeroplane, especially in the case of Greece. We know that that's not the ideal uh, when it comes to uh, sustainable uh, living. But on the other hand, this is a thing where you have to find the right balance uh, for everything. Okay, thank you very much, Eleni. Uh, we will be taking a small break now. Uh, Eleni, we know we won't have you uh, anymore with us, but you've spent quite some time with us. So thank you very much also for answering all, all the questions and taking part in the discussion that took place. And we will uh, reconvene at uh, quarter past six. Would that be okay? Just a five minute break, everyone. And then we continue with third part of Sabine and two local presentations. And our schedule will be tight in the third session. Thank you very much. Thank Bye, you. Bye. Nice to see you. Could, uh... Okay, <laughs> welcome back everyone. The recording is also um, on. So uh, now we will proceeding with uh, Sabine's uh, third part of the presentation about compensating and contributing. Sabine, if you could keep it uh, short, uh, around four minutes even would be lovely so that we can go into Maria and Anthea afterwards. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nasia, and um, thanks for also bringing forward the compensating part. And I saw also that Pierre uh, 
mentions it. Um, I purposely chose to rather go for contributing, considering that uh, compensation can be um, also um, a very tricky situation, where, which incentivizes uh, overconsumption, right? And um, especially for the Greek domain, uh, as far as uh, we've been able to tell through the, the ATRE project research as well, um, the, the compensation market has not necessarily um, uh, sprouted in, in the country, for, for better or worse, and thus uh, carbon credits, for example, are usually um, bought uh, far away abroad, so for a, a small uh, travel agent uh, somewhere in France, for example, uh, trees are being planted uh, in uh, Indonesia or a really remote um, part of the world with uh, other complexities there in terms of uh, social tensions and, and dynamics which are far removed from our realities. So it opens a, a, a tricky and complex domain. Uh, contributing is something that at least uh, uh, in my perspective and also the way that we've uh, been operating with the ACT project is uh, much more uh, tangible uh, within the reach of uh, each of us as, as travelers um, and um, also potentially more uh, regenerative in the sense of giving back, giving back to ourselves as well, uh, making things more meaningful. And this is where um, I make the, the transition into what I uh, mentioned in the very beginning as new tendencies uh, arising, well, and new being uh, during the past 20 years, actually, <laughs> uh, from the model that we are all well too familiar uh, with, the, the one based on continuous growth of tourism in numbers, the sea, sun, and sand, right, the uh, predominant one for the past 60 years. Uh, on which tourism currently depends on or has grown dependent on and thereby uh, specific communities, uh, including uh, the Greek context. Nevertheless, uh, this doesn't necessarily call for a ban on tourism or you know, uh, seeing it as a, a de facto a, a negative um, um, a, a catastrophe bringing uh, element. It can be a force if, uh, and at least this is the take of regenerative tourism, uh, globally managed properly by the communities that receive the guests. So uh, the part around um, the, the ways that we manage this, uh, this reception becomes much more important than sending people outwards. And uh, also the part whereby they are perceived as guests rather than um, tourists or consumers or worse uh, targets to be exploited, which still is very predominant. Um, and thereby also um, goes uh, the um, declaration uh, of a number of uh, tourist agents already since 2002, the Cape Town Declaration on Responsible Tourism, which intends to make better places for people to live in and for people to visit, but in that order. So the, the augmented emphasis right now on uh, the fact that uh, tourism is also a social force. It, uh, it allows for livelihoods, for communities to flourish, um, it allows for exchanges. Uh, I mean, um, I imagine humanity would be extremely different if uh, if we were not possible to to share with each other and um, reap all the benefits of of the exchanges. Nevertheless, uh, being responsible uh, meaning means a significant uh, capacity to respond to act. Some of the indicative ways that here and in our local context, uh, we consider feasible and uh, also, as I said previously, um, meaningful to, to make are in examples uh, of making positive contributions to the conservation of natural, cultural, heritage, 
the maintenance of world diversity, which can be through the support of local conservation associations, like all of the ones included in the CPF network. Supporting them could be volunteering with them, donating, getting to know about them just as we, we do now. And uh, creating connections, more meaningful connections, can be with local people. These initiatives are typically local as well. Um, it can be with the connection on, of the, the lo local, cultural, social, environmental issues of a place. And um, it could range from uh, participating in citizen science programs to simply creating uh, meaningful chats uh, uh, at the local coffee place and getting to know more in depth a specific uh, place that is visited. So this is uh, the, the type of um, qualitative uh, distinction that regenerative responsible tourism wants to make instead of uh, the impersonal and uh, mass consumption model of the previous type that we have, we, we've known all too well. A third uh, potential contribution, which especially all of us uh, here attending today, is becoming ambassadors, carrying those messages, the learning, the respect, giving feedback also to the stakeholders in the tourism value chains from potentially all the um, providers that have given us uh, transport, accommodation, again, food, um, guiding activities, spreading the, the word and the good news as well to them. And uh, towards the closure, uh, I want us to leave also with a potentially dynamic ending and not necessarily alarming one. Uh, it's not myself talking here, huh? back uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, Heraclitus said that the only constant in life is change. And um, when previously someone asked about um, the economic, let's say, viability of uh, the forward-looking uh, businesses in tourism, we maybe change for us as humans is, uh, is hard to anticipate and uh, perceive beyond the 20-year scope, apparently. Um, nevertheless, it happens and sometimes much more instantly uh, than, than we can imagine. A fierce example of that having been the collapse of the Thomas Cook tour operator, a 185-year-old, the oldest one in the UK, which all of a sudden, with the combination of um, a severe uh, dry, um, dry summer in England and mounting debts, climate change effects, suddenly did not have enough people uh, to, to fill in their bookings. This has been a major change in, in the industry. So this has happened. Uh, it, this is a, a, a large scale uh, outside of Greece example. We can also consider immediate impacts that we've been noticing in, in uh, the past year, for instance, of uh, locations being uh, completely banned from access uh, because of over tourism. The example of uh, Hrissi Island, no longer accessible uh, from the months of May to October because of being overused. And um, we're entering this new era of uh, discussing now whether a destination will be climate suitable and um, a very large uh, monitoring uh, European work exists around that, the Copernicus system, which uh, will inform of destinations of what type of um, climate profile and uh, a corresponding index for tourism they will have in the upcoming years. Whether, for example, temperature are going to be much more extreme in that place and it will no longer be visited. In, in France, in terms of bookings, the statistics are obvious. Now the, the balance is uh, shifting from the previously uh, adored, let's say, uh, Côte d'Azur, uh, Mediterranean uh, southeast side, towards northern, more cooler places where people can actually enjoy the, the freshness rather than um, burn uh, under the heat. 
also another striking example, again, coming from France, but uh, from um, a place where climate change has not only um, had its effect, uh, it, it constitutes a new reality. And this is in high mountains, uh, especially in the, the area of the Alps. Uh, it is currently absolutely impossible to be a mountain guide and a, a high mountain guide, especially the way one used to be, because simply no longer uh, the presence of, of snow is, is no longer assured. And thus, the, there is what is called the redirection of, of their activity. Um, it is not that this industry has shut down, but it has adapted. It has entirely new sets of practices adapted to the seasonality and the change of activities, uh, which has transformed. This is the, the triptych of uh, resilience, vulnerability, and adaptation, which go hand in hand and make this, this cycle, which uh, the prediction is we will, whether or not we want to, inevitably have to get more used to. That was it from me. And uh, open to if we have a few questions towards the Thank end. You. Thank you, Savina. Um, there are no questions right now in the chat, as I see. Uh, but I think we should proceed um, with Maria's presentation and then with Anthe's presentation and maybe take all, uh, all questions in the end. Um, let's see. Hi, Maria. Hello. Happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm also very happy to be here and uh, listen to all this nice and useful information. Mm -hmm. uh, I am Let a... me present you if you uh -huh. don't mind. Yes, thanks. Also for the recording, it helps <laughs> because we're <laughs> cutting slots. Sorry for that. So uh, Maria Nomiku is with uh, Mitato of Amargos and the Finding Greece. Maria will share with us the work of Finding Greece, offering visitors of Cycladic Islands a range of experience-based walking tours, weaving through matters of food, culture, sea, and land. She will then link this approach to the Mitato of Amorgos efforts, a non-for-profit association that organizes collective actions to repair drywall landscape features on the island of Amorgos. So Maria, the floor is yours. And if you want, you can reintroduce yourself if you'd like to say something more. No, Thanks. Okay, you said that. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, uh, let's see. Uh, Fighting Greece, uh, it's an um, alternative tourism ag agency, uh, which was founded in uh, 2017. Uh, its founder, uh, Samel Drimoniti, uh, is a qualified architect uh, with uh, postgraduate studies in geography, tourism, and um, uh, education. Uh, the love for the island uh, had led her to live uh, in Amorgos permanently. And um, uh, she liked to introduce the beauties of Amorgos and uh, its traditions to the visitors by uh, organizing this uh, very nice uh, agents. Uh, the philosophy behind uh, Fighting Greece is to create an alternative and original experiences for uh, the people who visit uh, Amorgos. Uh, its uh, purpose is to promote a more sustainable uh, tourist model, taking into consideration um, the uniqueness of uh, the small island of Amorgos uh, by creating a more uh, genuine experience for the visitors. Uh, during this experience, uh, visitors have the opportunity to interact uh, with the locals, uh, discover hidden uh, beauties of the island, and be a part of uh, its traditions. Activities such as uh, Greek dance classes, uh, Greek language classes, and ceramic classes can make uh, the visitor feel more included in the local society and maybe participate in uh, local events, fiestas, etc. Um, these activities involve uh, many local providers and um, this uh, getting in, in touch with the visitors creates a very interesting uh, network, uh, contact and collaboration and social interaction. 
Uh, in addition, uh, there are uh, experiences based in the local gastronomy, uh, which are uh, cooking and pastry classes, uh, food tour, and uh, the only group uh, in which um, one can um, meet uh, the local product uh, producers, uh, the shepherds, uh, to um, get to know how you make the local cheese. Uh, or to find um, um, to make a route around the olive trees, to uh, visit an old olive uh, pressure, and uh, learn a little bit the procedure uh, from uh, how to make uh, the oil uh, from uh, the old times uh, until now. And uh, <clears throat> and okay, I'll see this. Uh, Finding Greece also offers guided tours as, um, as well as hiking tours uh, around the trails of Amorgos. Uh, on this pass, uh, there are uh, plenty of agricultural and cultural monuments uh, that are connected to many stories and myths from the pirate season to the occupation of the uh, First and Second World War. And this can become a very interesting experience for the visitors um, to learn and gain many information for the history of Amorgos. Uh, in order uh, to give uh, prominence to the local culture uh, and tradition, Finding Greece began including local actions and initiatives in uh, the experiences offered. Um, a new hiking tour um, it has been introduced now in 2023. Uh, it, it, it's called it the Peaceful Lagada. And um, the visitor can discover, uh, discover the results of uh, three main projects undertaken, undertaken by the local nonprofit partnership uh, and that of Amorgos, in which I'm also co-founder and very proud. <laughs> uh, the main goal of this tour is to promote the cultural heritage of a uh, dry stone building, uh, to point out alternative uh, points of interest such as uh, natural springs or agricultural monuments, and make visitors understand that uh, local society respects and maintain uh, their cultural and uh, their land. Metato um, Famorgos uh, is a, a non-profit partnership. It was uh, founded uh, during the, the first lockdown. We didn't know what to do. So we do <laughs> in two, 2020. Uh, our main um, goals are to raise awareness within the local society uh, for environmental issues and cultural heritage to help uh, the new generation to get in touch with the traditional crafts like uh, dry stone building, uh, protect and promote the paths, the cultural and agricultural uh, monuments of the island. And here is some of our projects. The first uh, dry stone um, works dressed on works of the Amorgian uh, craftsmanship, uh, which took place in October 2021. And the CPF helped us a lot with this. It was our first uh, project and uh, really they were very supportive. Uh, as a result, with this uh, workshop, uh, we managed to restore 25 of uh, meters of dry stone wall sections and create uh, approximately 40 meters of the cobblestone path, which is a, a, a trail with, uh, built it with stones. Uh, in October 2022, we had our second workshop. And uh, during this workshop, we had uh, 40 meters of dry, uh, dry stone walls restored and um, 33 meters of uh, cobblestone path. It was actually the continued, um, the second part of uh, the first dry stone workshop. We continued 
the building from where we started the, the first year. And uh, finally, here is our craftsman Lightis with uh, his team. And uh, finally, uh, the history of water, uh, where we managed to restore uh, an old uh, water, water tank, uh, which was, um, see, it was keeping uh, water for one of the natural springs of the area. And um, <clears throat> to, we cleaned also all the area around and we managed to um, people to see because you, uh, before you couldn't see the spring. Now it's so beautiful that if you see it, you will cry. Uh, all, these, uh, all these projects were um, uh, took place in uh, the same area around Strubos. It's a semi-abandoned settlement uh, outside of Lagada. And uh, all, all this project together created a very interesting uh, uh, ensemble, which is uh, very worth to visit. And uh, we are very proud. Here are, is the spring. Yes. And um, I would like to add here uh, that uh, what uh, Len said something that inspired me a lot before. Uh, I would like to say that our culture is not just a monument of the past that we just look at it and we feel proud about it. Uh, it can apply to the present. Uh, a Dresden building is uh, very important for uh, uh, the landscape of the islands. Even now, we will not have the islands if we don't have uh, these uh, techniques and uh, that everybody thinks it's just a, mo a monument. And um, <clears throat> also the visitors, um, they, it's not only a matter of them, how they behave uh, when they reach a um, holiday, a place. It's also the local society. If it, the local society uh, shows to them that they love and they respect their land, they will do it too. It's a, an interaction, I think. It's a, they take it, and the, the local society gives them how do they act when they come for holidays. That's it from me. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Very inspirational. And it's really nice that you make the link also to the past and the present and the future of the islands. That exactly if we consider what we see the past, then the islands of the present and of the future are not going to be the same anymore. We're losing cultural heritage and uh, we're losing what makes these islands unique if we don't try to take care of it and keep the, the, the traditions running. Um, yes. And try to, yes. So uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, let's take just these two and then proceed with um, Thib. It's, al it's already 22 uh, 7. Um, Savina says to draw it's the link. It's not a climate question change. on my side, it's a, a note. Oh. Me, just another question, maybe. Okay, so you'd like to leave it for the discussion, you mean, Savina? Or Oh, no, it's okay. You can go into a question, maybe, so that we don't. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, then the question is from Salome. Uh, if we want to participate to Mitato or water restoration tank, can we experience that in 2023? Do we have any learning or workshop, workshop we can submit in for this year during summer season or not? So it seems like uh, Salome is in our host. That would be lovely to <laughs> can link uh, directly, but let us know, Maria, also for others that may be interested. The uh, restoration uh, was finished in, on December 2022, but uh, we will have the, our third uh, dry stone workshop uh, hopefully in October, uh, in the middle of October of 2023. And we will change place, we will go to the south of Amorgos. And it will be very interesting because we will work uh, with uh, other uh, craftsmen and it's a very nice place also there and very interesting. And you are welcome to join. I can send you also our mail and our contacts to what, because we announce it. So you can um, participate. 
Thank you very much, Maria. In the follow-up notes that Dorothy will share, you can let us know which email you'd like to send out to every participant. Uh, so Salom can contact you directly through the email you will uh, uh, give us. And Annie says, very inspirational indeed. Hope we can identify you many green volunteers and hands to help. And that Anders Rich is another marvelous exemplary initiative where uh, volunteers can, uh, can support. So uh, for everyone participating, uh, in case you weren't here in previous webinars as well, one other uh, target of this series is to find the people that are interested to support local initiatives. You may want to also refer to our third webinar, Local Participation, where we discuss how one should approach the issue of wanting to be an engaged volunteer for certain months a year that they're on the island or even all year round if uh, you live on the, on the islands. And some um, links of safe no say are shared by Amalia Zepo on the chat. Thank you very much. And let's proceed, please, with uh, Anthi Arvaniti. And then we'll get back to the question in the discussion about how we can join forces on uh, drywall uh, stone um, protection and refurbishment. So Anthi is joining uh, today uh, from Santorini. Uh, Anthi, Dorothy will be sharing your slides. So let That's me well. introduce you. Thank you. Uh, Anthea Vaniti of the Yorgaros Fishing Tours in Santorini, uh, captain of the Yorgaros Fishing Boat, or Kaiki, as we call it in Greek, and member of the recently established National Fishing Tourism Association for Professional Fishermen, Anthea, leads fishing tourism trips in Santorini, hosting multiple international visitors on board. She practices what we call responsible fishing tourism, and she will give us the deck tour of how this service aligns experiential trips on fishing boats with marine preservation. And see the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. And Dorothy, please uh, uh, share the photos. Thank you both. Uh, good evening uh, from me too. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, all this um, conversation today has been very inspiring um, for, for me too. And um, it's very nice to know that there is a community of people that uh, we can discuss uh, things like uh, the ones we discussed uh, today. Um, as you uh, mentioned before, uh, the, I do uh, fishing tours in Sadorini and uh, we started since 2016. Uh, we try to make it um, the most sustainable possible because of course, um, there are uh, things that we need to improve and uh, we are quite aware of those. Um, I'll start saying uh, that the boat is, um, is a wooden traditional fishing boat. And for the moment in Greece, we don't have um, a way to have them more um, environmental friendly. So right now, unfortunately, we have um, a diesel engine. So this is one of the things that we need to improve. Uh, but uh, already we have some solar panels and we try to have our lights um, using those uh, solar uh, panels. And uh, every year we want to, wait to improve ourselves more and more to this um, direction. Um, as for the, the, the fishing, the way we do more um, responsible fishing, um, actually, uh, the way we do the fishing tours is uh, based on uh, three very basic uh, principles. One of them is to make it more um, sustainable and um, eco-friendly. Uh, the other one is we, uh, we want to, um, to share with people the, um, uh, something authentic, something uh, that belongs to the, uh, to the Greek culture. And we want also to share with people uh, an experience, not to, not to sell a service. Uh, so this is the three basic principles that we uh, are based on. Uh, as for the fishing now, because this is very controversial, I think, uh, my vocabulary for the moment is uh, uh, minimized because uh, we speak most of the time for fishing. So today I have to refresh my vocabulary a lot. <laughs> Uh, so, when somebody uh, listens to something like fishing, an activity like that, is not um, the sustainability or the um, uh, eco-friendly uh, 
thing that comes to their mind. Uh, but what we do on the uh, on this boat is we try to find uh, ways to be um, as more sustainable and responsible we can. Uh, for example, in Greece, we use fishing nets. Uh, the fishing nets is something that people can see all around um, uh, the Greek um, traditional fishing boats. And um, uh, the way we use them is that every year we use less and less of them. So, for example, when we started in 2016, we used to have around um, 3,000 kilometers of uh, fishing nets. Uh, now we, ha we use around 500 meters. So this is a, a, I think a, a very big uh, a number of nets that we don't use. And this means that we catch also less fish. Uh, we uh, took the decision instead of selling our fish to use them only for our guests. So uh, we do um, what we do fishing, we, uh, our guests um, eat the catch of the day. And uh, our income depends on our guest tickets, not on the amount of the fish we're going to catch. Uh, like this, um, we don't aim to catch more and more fish, but we just want to catch a small amount of fish enough to feed um, our guests. And um, this is a great way to, um, to have a low impact uh, in uh, fishing uh, in general. Uh, as you, uh, before I mentioned that uh, we um, share an experience with our guests, as you can see here the picture, uh, our guests help to take the fish out of the fishing nets. And uh, something very important is that uh, they help to take out the fish that are not mature yet and they should go back to the sea. Uh, I would say that um, tourism has helped a lot and uh, uh, they made us change. So, uh, not only we can inform them and make them uh, and uh, teach them more sustainable ways, but they do the same thing to us too. So since the first day that we started the fishing tours, uh, we were not uh, as sustainable as we are now because um, people help a lot. Uh, uh, tourism by itself, um, our guests and visitors, they uh, share with us more uh, ways that we can um, help uh, the environment. Uh, people um, participate in everything. So here you can see uh, they learn how to clean the fish. That's a way also, of, at least this is uh, how I feel about it. When you know that uh, the things we're going, we're going to eat, uh, they are not like fish sticks in a box. They, are, they have a life from before. People are more uh, responsible about eating them. And um, uh, there is more respect when we have a plate with food, we should eat as much as we need, not uh, more just to fulfill our, um, our eyes. Um, here you can see um, a young boy helping with the fishing nets and a young girl. Uh, many times we have children that um, learn how to use uh, how to use, for example, the fishing net, something that maybe they haven't seen from before. And they understand also that to have a fish uh, on a plate, it takes some effort. It's not something that uh, it just happens uh, by opening the fridge and taking some uh, fish sticks from the, from the cooler. Uh, it's also very important from such a young age to learn um, uh, ways to, um, to behave in a way that is more um, uh, friendly to the environment. Uh, before we said that um, when we catch fish, we cook them on the boat. And see here you can see uh, the catch of the day and um, people gather all together. So uh, we uh, get to share um, and to become just one company on the boat. Uh, we try to have uh, our own uh, bottles and um, glasses and uh, plates that we wash on the boat. So we don't use uh, uh, plates and glasses that are for one use. And uh, unfortunately, during COVID, um, they said that we, we have to use the ones that are just for one use. And uh, this was the only time that uh, we were not um, uh, doing this practice of just washing our uh, the, 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 um, the plates and the glass that we already have. 
Uh, also, the, the soaps that we use for to wash uh, the plates and the, bottle, the, and the um, glasses, they are um, soaps that are uh, friendly for the, uh, for, the, for the planet. There are some just at the uh, local markets, and I'm very happy that even here in Sedorini, we have some of those at the, just at the markets and we can buy from there. Um, many times we have families that instead of uh, taking an activity just um, uh, that uh, is going to be on just a cruise around the island, they prefer to, um, to go on a fishing tour and uh, to learn more things about uh, uh, the fish and their life. Something that uh, we always do on the boat is that when we have a catch, um, we always share with our guests what we know about uh, every uh, species. Uh, for example, over here, all those people, they hold um, male parrotfish. Uh, the, par the parrotfish, they have been like 5,000 years in Mediterranean Sea, is a very um, old species. And uh, the males are more black, gray, and the females are red with some yellow uh, lines. I see. Sorry, we, we missed you there. So the last 30 seconds or so. So if you could just uh, uh, repeat. Yes. Mm -hmm. I Sorry. was just saying some um, things about the, the fish that those people uh, hold. Those are parrot fish. And um, uh, on the boat, every time we try to uh, inform our uh, guests what um, characteristics um, each fish has. Uh, and I think this is very important because most people, they just order um, the more famous fish at the restaurants and they don't know that when they choose a fish and when, and when they catch a fish, this has a huge impact on the environment. Uh, for example, there are some species that are more um, endangered, some species that are invasive, that, and th those are the species that we should try to catch more and more. Um, and I, I think there are more pictures of those um, uh, invasive species uh, later. Uh, in one of uh, the um, conversations today, uh, I'm sorry that I don't remember exactly who said that, about uh, that we should uh, cook and use what it is uh, seasonal. Uh, that's what we try also to do on the boat. Whenever we have the, when is the time for the zucchinis and the eggplants, this is what we cook on, on the boat. Or uh, Sadorini has um, uh, tomatoes. Of course, we don't have the cherry tomatoes all the time. It's just for a few months. So uh, we need also to bring from Crete and from other islands too. And uh, when we uh, have on the boat uh, lunch or dinner, uh, we don't cook just the, the cuts of the day, but we uh, use also some uh, local products and uh, vegetables and salads. Here in Sadorin, something very uh, specific is also capers, what you saw before in the salad. Uh, okay, this is the picture I wanted, that's perfect. So um, here you see on the left, uh, this little girl, she holds um, two fish that uh, are invasive species. Uh, so every time um, we catch those fish, we help to balance the um, sea biodiversity because um, uh, with the Suez opening and the climate change, some invasive, invasive species have um, arrived at the Mediterranean um, uh, Sea. And this didn't happen just yesterday or the last years, but it has uh, happened many years before, like 1960s. The problem is that now, because of the sea, um, of the rise of the sea temperature, uh, those uh, the the sea of the Mediterranean uh, place is not so uh, cold. It becomes more and more tropical and more warm. So th those species they can um, survive and uh, like uh, and um, a result. Uh, many other uh, local species, they start to vanish. Uh, this little girl and her sister, I remember them, this was last year, they, uh, this day they had like a competition between them, who's gonna catch more of those invasive species because they wanted to help the environment. And um, the, after that, they, they don't like eating fish, but after that, because they know that it's a good thing to cook the invasive species, they 
had them for dinner too. Uh, then uh, the lady in the middle, she holds um, a stingray that was trapped by uh, accident in the fishing nets. And things like that happen. I don't want to say that the fishing net is um, uh, a pure way of fishing. Of course, sometimes there might be accidents and uh, that's, and we try to avoid them by using uh, the, the nets less time in the water and using less fishing nets. Uh, this thing, the stingrays, they are invasive species, uh, sorry, they are endangered species in general. So it's always good to put them back to the sea. Uh, the one that this lady holds is um, a species that is not even dangerous to touch. It doesn't have a beak or something like that. Uh, and then uh, the man um, that holds the another invasive species here, those invasive species, uh, they have many different names. So. Uh, the one that you see here, the pictures, the one that uh, the girl and the men uh, hold, both of them, uh, they, they, they are called pilot fish. And uh, the one is the, um, uh, and in every place they go, they take different colors, uh, like uh, the, um, I don't remember the, the animal that changes colors, but they uh, change uh, colors in any, every environment that they are uh, around. Um, as you can see here, uh, the, our guests, they catch fish by themselves because we want to share an experience with them, not to just, um, we don't want to let them see how we catch fish, but we want them to participate in that and uh, be a member of, um, of this uh, uh, try. Uh, you can see here some uh, very uh, natural pictures, I would say, uh, the reaction of people, of the people when they catch uh, a fish. Um, most um, uh, fishing tours around the world, uh, they promote uh, the big fish, who is going to catch the big fish. Uh, what we want to do here is who is going to catch the, um, we want to see the, uh, from the way we catch fish, the big results later, not the big fish actually, but the way that fishing can be um, better. Uh, and uh, the, as it, mo most of our guests, they, the target fish uh, is to catch invasive species. Of course, occasionally you, we might see bigger fish, but most of our guests, they know from before, from our website that um, our philosophy is to catch more of those invasive species, and this is what um, they are trying for on the boat. Uh, for those uh, invasive species, uh, I, uh, I tried to tell them uh, which they are and what uh, of those, um, which of those they can find in their own places, because every sea, every place in the world has different uh, invasive species. And um, uh, we try to inform them when they go to the restaurants to order fish to know from before, uh, that with their choice, they can help even uh, when they sit in a restaurant and they are going to, to eat. Uh, the lady here with the, that holds the barracuda, that is a bigger fish, uh, she uh, put it back to the sea later. She didn't want to eat it, it was her, her birthday and she was the only one on the boat that uh, uh, caught a fish like that. Uh, as for the size, other guests, they got uh, smaller fish that day. So we said that it was like a gift of uh, nature um, to them. And many of our guests, they catch fish for the first time. They've never caught fish from before. So uh, the way we uh, practice fishing, I think is a very good uh, way to start because they uh, leave the concept of catching the bigger fish to have the concept of um, being more responsible uh, uh, about uh, catching fish. Uh, the fish that you see here, the two ladies hold, this is a bigger size uh, barracuda. So we uh, kept it on the boat and we didn't um, uh, put it back to the ship because it was uh, big enough and we cooked it uh, for those ladies and uh, get the rest of the guests that were on the boat. And um, I think I have uh, spoken enough um, about some types of uh, fishing. And um, today with the conversation, I uh, took uh, inspiration to say more things about what we do. Uh, before I say that, uh, I would like just to comment on this, uh, on the fish that you see um, 
the two fish that are long ones, we call them uh, trumpet fish. And those fish, they, uh, their main diet is uh, the eggs of uh, the other species. So this is, uh, that's how, this has a very bad um, impact at the sea uh, biodiversity since they don't leave any other species to, uh, to exist and uh, grow. Um, when we, uh, to what I was referred before, um, when we catch some fish, usually the box of the fish that we have is uh, enough to feed around six, maximum 10 people. And we go fishing every day. Uh, so we see if we have enough fish, if we see that we have enough fish, we don't even practice um, catching more of those or we uh, release them back to the sea. And um, uh, if the food is more than what we want, because sometimes uh, people say that they're still hungry and we cook uh, more of the fish that we have caught. And then in the end, they don't finish their own food. Uh, we always uh, leave this food and we share it, the leftovers, the uh, clear leftovers. Uh, we uh, share them with the sailors back to the harbor. We don't waste any of the food that um, it is caught um, every time. Um, I wrote a few notes before when um, uh, you were speaking and one moment to see if there is um, something that, uh, uh, I think I've shared with you most of those. We use also um, bins, recycled bins, so people can drop their, um, uh, from the drinks. For example, in Sadorini, we don't have, um, uh, drinking water, drinkable water, that much is one, we don't have any water springs. Actually, there is just one that is small and not enough to, to share with all of uh, the guests that visit the, the island every year. So uh, on our boat, we have some plastic bottles. And for this reason, we have also some uh, bins that people can use. Uh, they can drop uh, there the plastic and, um, and in a different one, the cans that we that people use for their uh, beers, things like that. Uh, this is in this box. You see an example of um, uh, a very very good catch. So this is uh, this catch is for more than four people. That day we had those two couples. So uh, all the fish that was uh, left, we kept we kept them uh, in ice for the next day. Uh, so because we do with nature and nature is not always, um, uh, the weather is not always perfect. Uh, the plate that you see with cooked uh, fish, those are the um, uh, fish that we saw from before, the invasive species that are very uh, tasty, the pilot, uh, the pilot fish. Uh, they have many different names. So you may hear them like um, uh, spine foods uh, or pilot fish or um, uh, the ones that have, uh, the, some people say Germanos in Greek, many different types of uh, names for those um, uh, species. Um, like uh, the last, uh, one of the last things that uh, I want to, to mention is that we uh, put back to the sea the fish that are not uh, uh, mature enough, like the one that you see over here. This is a small tuna, a small type of tuna. So uh, we, let, we let it go back um, the sea as soon as we uh, we caught it. Um, the fishing tours is something that uh, I see every year that people love more and more uh, on the island. And um, our guests, they ask uh, what else they can do that has um, the same pr principles, like uh, this, uh, to be uh, more eco-friendly and uh, to find something authentic and uh, traditional. So um, this year we work in, a, in one more project. This is something very new. I still don't have a website or something like that, but uh, it is very similar to, uh, I would say to like finding in Greece that you mentioned before, but just for Sadorini uh, is going to be, uh, it's going to be called G Tours. And uh, I have found already 20 activities uh, that, have um, uh, low impact in, in, the, in the environment and they are more traditional and um, 
uh, and uh, experimental people can um, live and experience uh, with those activities. Uh, for the moment, uh, it is something that we work on. So uh, it would be, would be perfect if a next time in a new webinar, uh, this may be in one year from now or six months from now, it's ready. So uh, we would share more things um, uh, about that with you. Um, for the for the video, I don't know if um, this plays on my screen. It doesn't, but uh, yeah, this I'll, I can play it. I just need to reshare with sound. Mm -hmm. So should I do that? And uh, thank you very much for helping today with slides and everything. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, but those are skills that I miss. <laughs> Let me. Let's try it. Very good. Good. So happy that um, One more thing we could say about uh, this year, we released uh, dozens of those fish back to the water, and every day we release uh, fish back to the sea. I don't remember even one day to that we don't put back to the sea fish. It's not only catching; it's also um, uh, catching the right. Uh, the right phase. Um, about the climate change that you said before, um, most of the cuts that we had with bigger species was uh, the months that are colder. So when the um, uh, temperature uh, rises, we have less and less uh, species, local species, and this is a huge problem. I've seen during only the last eight years that I do the fishing tours, um, that many fish have already vanished, at least from the place that we, uh, we that uh, um, we used to go fishing and we saw every uh, different season. And some of them, they move, uh, they pass from Sadorini different uh, seasons now. Uh, there was a fish that we called needlefish, and uh, we used to uh, to see many of those in the end of um, in the first days of Octo October and September, first days of October. It has been uh, almost uh, four years now that we haven't seen them uh, passing from Sadorini at all. So all this um, climate change has an impact um, everywhere and we can see it with our own eyes um, every day. Um, with um, the uh, Fishing Tourism Association that I'm also a member, uh, we want to share with uh, more people uh, that uh, the fishing tours in Greece, they can help uh, change uh, in the change um, the, the professional fishermen instead of uh, catching more and more fish depending on the amount of fish that they, they catch. They can just start fishing tours and they can catch uh, less fish, but uh, get paid uh, in almost the same way because some people they have families and they may ask if I don't go fishing how I'm going to feed uh, my family so uh, the the ticket uh, of our guests that people uh, pay uh, this help just not only um, to pay for a, a business but also to help uh, uh, people think in a different way and to practice in a different way um, instead of uh, going fishing, um, the professional fishermen, I mean, instead of going fishing and catch tons of fish, they go, uh, and we go, I'm also uh, a part of that, we go fishing um, just for a few hours, we catch just one box of fish instead of uh, tons of fish that uh, we would need to catch in order to, to live. Um, even the, the diesel, the petrol that we use, um, for example, my uncles that they still do uh, commercial fishing, uh, they use uh, the, the petrol that I use for one year, they use it in one month and a half. So even this is a, a big difference. And um, there are many different ways and many activities that people can do uh, on the island. Um, most people, they have combined Sadorini with, with an island that is just for uh, taking uh, pictures for Instagram. Uh, I want to tell you from here, from today, and uh, uh, with the project that we um, are going to do uh, in the next months, and also 
from um, this invitation today that I was very happy to participate uh, in this, that uh, there are still many activities on the island that uh, they try for the change and um, to be more um, equal, let's say. <laughs> Nice. Shall I shall I play this last video? Mm -hmm. Yes, I thank you. That's my favorite. Okay. <laughs> yes. You ready? Yes. Back to the sea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, MP. Uh, so we're past beyond our our time, and there are people uh, leaving. So we're done with the presentations. Um, we still would like to stay and discuss a little bit longer, maybe for another 10, 15 minutes, maybe close off a little bit before half past seven. So for those of you that can stay with us, that would be lovely. For those of you that need to, to run, thank you for being with us. Know that the CPF is trying to link local initiatives. And what we're doing today about eco-visitors is something, let's say, additional to what we do. Our efforts are mostly to support local initiatives on the ground and try to link them with each other. Uh, this links also some questions that were mentioned on the on the chat. Uh, so with that, I think we can go on into a discussion with those of you that are willing to remain for a little bit longer and address any questions that were uh, previously posted on the chat. Um, so starting maybe backwards. It's now, mm -hmm. Sorry, Nasia, maybe sorry. it's now the time for the people, if they're happy to open their camera and raise their hand and share their questions, you know, like with open, Microphones, it's it's good for us to see faces and hear your voice. But of course, if sure. there are already some questions in the chat, please share them with the audience too. Thank you. Yes, there was a, anyone can raise their hands on or write in the chat in case you cannot unmute yourselves. So uh Natasha Sapuna wrote previously for Anthe, you're doing an amazing job. Congratulations. I wanted to ask you what kind of nets do you use? Trammel nets or gill nets, gill nets? Not sure how this is uh, pronounced. And then another question for Anthe by Vicky Preston. What is the name of the project? She's in the process of creating with other local initiatives in sustainable tourism. Um, so for the first uh, question, it is uh, Gill Nets. And uh, we, uh, we use um, bigger, we, we call it an eye. Eye is how uh, big is the hole from the fishing nets. We use uh, the biggest there is, exists um, in Greece right now because we want to cut the bigger size fish, not the smaller ones. And uh, we also um, sew our fishing nets. We don't buy um, nets all the time. We try to use to reuse our own uh, fishing nets. So uh, after 70 years, since 2016, uh, this year we had to buy some new parts of fishing nets. For 70 years, we used um, the same nets. And um, the new project that we are working on is uh, uh, G Tours. It's called, uh, it is called G Tours from uh, Green, Green Tours and uh, some other. Uh, um, and Yorgaros. And, and Yorgaros too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, you can find us right now on um, Facebook, um, TikTok, and Instagram. We have those uh, social media. Uh, ready, uh, but we are working on the website and um, on the um, uh, partnerships. Uh, for the moment, 18 uh, activities, they have uh, agreed with us that they want to participate in that, and we continue. I hope that- Thank you, uh, Ansi. Yes, and we are happy to, if you share with us also the link of your new initiative, in social media, we're happy to share with the registered participants so that they can find you easier. Uh, we can include it in the follow-up notes. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Also, there was a comment for you just that catch a release. Uh, Annie is saying that uh, you and Thea are a real champion in sustainability for fishing trips. Well done for being, being open to change and you paved the way for others to follow. And then she says uh, she even serves edible alien fish for the visitors to taste them, pick the alien real experience. You also mentioned yes. the Germanos previously. And it's also important uh, to, to stress, also linking to Maria's presentation, that uh, preserving also the profession of, uh, of fishermen and doing fishing tourist, uh, tourism tours with actual professional fishermen is important. And the experience 
of the visitors on your boats compared to another boat is that they can also learn the, the, from the experience and the culture of how the traditional fishing happens in Greece compared to just enjoying a scenery. So this is also about understanding better the social context that one is visiting, the traditional professions um, in insular and coastal Greece. So it's also important to, to stress this, uh, these issues. And, and, and one last thing, sorry, I didn't mention before, uh, is that more uh, young people, they, um, they start liking fishing because um, professional fishermen, most of them, and the, the tradition of fishing in Greece, it is with elder people. And now uh, younger people uh, can combine um, uh, fishing with uh, being close to their homes so they can be more social. And this attracts more younger people in this um, uh, job, let's say. Okay, that's really important as well. Uh, we know it's an aging profession, so it's really important. Um, so another question for you, Anthe, uh, from Panayotis. Do you cook the predator eatable fish you catch? And are there restaurants on the island which are preparing alien fish? Could you please uh, repeat the, the question? Yeah, if you cook the, the predator edible fish that you catch. And if there are uh, any... Yes, if, if they are big enough, for example, some of the barracudas that you saw before, some of them were not were younger, so we leave them back to the sea. The ones that are uh, mature enough, we cook them uh, on the boat, yes. And uh, and all those invasive species, we cook them on the boat. And also, if there are any restaurants on the island that are preparing alien fish, uh, mm -hmm. we also saw in our first webinar, I, don't, I think, Panayotis, you were there, there I'm are. not sure. There is a, a map of uh, restaurants uh, around Greece that serve um, alien fish uh, prepared by IC in the context of uh, the collaboration for the Pick the Alien project that is now a national initiative. So you can refer back to that or if you were not a registered participant in the first webinar and you don't have this information, please let us know and we can forward it. And Anthe, please let us know for Santorini if there are actual restaurants that you'd like to refer to or otherwise one can go to the map and check. There are. Um, the, there is one that um, uh, was more active with that, but unfortunately they just closed um, uh, this year. And so I don't know the new owners if they are going to continue with that. And I know for sure that my partner's restaurant, uh, they always, uh, because uh, they, they want always to have a variety of fish for the guests like that when there is a variety. Uh, it's uh, even better than having uh, the same and the same famous fish because um, those fish have been overfished, the, the ones that are famous. So there is a plate at my partner's restaurant is with a variety of them. And uh, there are many of those um, invasive species in this plate. It's uh, Yorgaros, the name of the restaurant um, of my parents. I don't, I don't mention it because it belongs to my parents, but it's this and the other one that uh, is closed now are the two that I knew already and I have eaten already there and I know that they practice that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, so I think there are no more questions for, for you, but going backwards, uh, there was before a question for uh, Maria's uh, presentation. Uh, oh, Mrs. Zepu that actually had the the question is about to leave. I don't know if uh, you could stay just for a couple of minutes so that we can read it out loud. I'd like to ask uh, Annie to take this on. So it was uh, after, uh, during Mitat of Amargo's presentation, everything is very inspiring. For issues related to dry stone walls, water sharing, and endemic seeds, we have created a blog for Sifnos initiatives called Flea, and the link is on the chat. And the question is, how can we better join forces? And uh, now also the comment uh, before she's leaving, or I'm not sure if she's still with us. I also have to leave, unfortunately. Thank you very much for this initiative. I wish I could have followed the other webinars, but it's a very busy year. I would love to share what we do in CIFNOS and find more ways to collaborate, support each other, encourage our authorities to adopt sustainable tourism more actively and bring echo and eco, like uh, the way Savina wrote it before, ideas for more agro-eco entrepreneurial uh, activities. So, Anne, if you would like to, to 
take this on. Not oh, sure if uh, Mrs. Just to say, here, oh, but... Amalia, I'm happy to see you again. Let's talk, actually. Ah, you're <laughs> there. Okay, hi. We're trying to do our best, you know. I think we will be more active on SIFNOS moving forward because we have a lot of things to do there. And what we love to do is, like today, we try to link, you know, like the islands, people, knowledge. So you see today that there are people, initiatives on Andros and Amrogos, you know, in many other islands where okay. you can find connections. And we're really happy to make this bridge for you. Congratulations, uh, for, really, congratulations. It's, it's fantastic to see the link and how many people in each uh, different island are doing similar things. It's really fantastic. So really, congratulations. It's encouraging because, you know, there are so many challenges and there is a lot of disappointments. And, you know, we really need to, to make these people feel proud for what they're achieving. And that's why we say it's, a, you know, like small or bigger uh, local heroes and the local champions, as we say, the ones who safeguard the natural environment of, of the Cycladis, or at least they, they try to do the best they can. So we are all here to support them one way or another. I'll be in touch and try to help in many ways. Thank you very much. Really fantastic. Well done. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amalia. And uh, Maria from uh, Nomiku yes. from Amorgos that presented previously says, we would like feedback for seed uh, collection. Yes. So from Amalia directly, we're also trying to work on, on this LCPF and with uh, Elena Smerny that presented in the second on the land uh, webinar. So we are trying to, to link each other. There's a lot of work to be, to be done. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, there uh, was also a previous uh, comment that uh, uh. got a lot of um, from Pierre that got a lot of uh, responses about the funding idea, converting airplane carbon footprint needed to come in Greece for holidays in a donation to Greek NGOs platform based on the carbon market price. And uh, with the extra comment that this would not just be for compensating, but would actually be directed as a private donation to the local NGOs and that people are not really aware of what NGOs are out there. We are trying to raise awareness on, on that. And Pierre, I believe we're also scheduled or will be scheduled to have a call. So there are many things to, to discuss and how you can support us to, to do more. Uh, Annie, you mentioned some, something else. I think there are two more last comments that we should uh, share with everyone and then close the session and thank everyone for being so patient with us. Oh, okay, let me, let me read them. Um... Vicky says, thank you all once more for a wonderful set of informative and inspiration presentations today. You guys are amazing. Uh, thanks on behalf of everyone and of everyone who was in all four webinars actually uh, on the screens and at the back office because a lot was happening as well. Um, I'm looking forward to getting the video recording so I can share them with an even wider audience. Uh, so Vicky, anyone, the registration form will remain open. So, and people, um, every time a webinar was concluded, now we have concluded the whole series, people can actually register to the form in order to receive the recordings when they are, once they're available. So that means that they will, if they register in the form, they will get the information directly. If not, you can feel free once you are informed to forward the information uh, to anyone you would like. They will be uploaded on our website, uh, on the Green Volunteers of the Cyclades website that is now being, uh, uh, and reached with information and they will be visible to all. So there will be three ways to, to access those recordings. And then from uh, Natasha Sapuna, last comment, the only thing with a release, even if it's amazing to happen is that it has to happen as fast as possible and careful because because of the stress, the fish is not 100% sure that it will survive, even if it seems okay. There's a lot of scientific research on that. If you want to check, thanks a lot again. So that's also very, very interesting comments. And on a previous comment by Alexandra about litter collecting groups in Paros outside the summer months, there was um, some shared information on the chat by Vicky. Thank you, Vicky, about Paros Park Friends and some other local groups. And the Common Seas Initiative is something that runs all year round. It's not a, it's not a seasonal uh, initiative. Um, just to, to comment on that as well. I believe we have covered most of the things and actually it was really lovely today that the chat was very active. I think it was more active than usually giving answers to the, 
to the questions asked. Um, oh, and one more about the organic waste by Jack Atherton earlier. Is there any initiative in place for managing organic waste? It's a shame to see perfectly compostable waste in black bins, community composting, etc. There have been some answers in the chat. I have not gone through them, but I could also mention that there is a composting in Andros. There are two units in operation. There are also some compost bins in some schools uh, that we have installed. Uh, I mean, in collaboration with local entities, we have given out some grants for composting in schools. And there is a discussion to engage into community composting. That is something a little bit more challenging because in the school environment, challenging even though that also is, um, you have people around the school community that are always there. With the insular communities, it's an issue that everybody in the summer is extremely busy. Uh, so you would need to find a way to make sure that the compost bin is taken care of all year round. So it needs some, um, some, organi some organizing uh, in advance. There are small scale initiatives and some NGOs that also work uh, nationally on, on that. Uh, a reference to Tila's experience by Pierre previously. I think Tila's is inspiring other NGOs and other municipalities. It's a, it's a pioneer municipality for the last 20 years, being very graced with the, the mayors in charge there. Um, I think we have pretty much covered everything. There was also a question about the Ionian, uh, just to mention that we have two sister funds in Greece, part of the Conservation Collective, the Ionian Environment Foundation. Someone could refer to them for information about the Ionian Islands, that was about the drinking water, and the Ergolic Environment Fund at the Ergolic Fund. Uh, sorry, I'm rushing through this, <laughs> but I think we have pretty much covered everything now. So I'd like to thank everyone. If anybody else wants to make some final remarks and we call it a day and we call it an end of a lovely four webinar series and great thank you to Dorothy Filotti who is amazing and has done most of this work even though she's not very active in the webinars themselves because she's not coordinating. She's actually leading everything at the back that has led to what you're seeing. So thank you Dorothy for everything. And, and allow us please to thank the British Embassy in Athens, which was a supporter for the CPF from the beginning uh, when we started planning this idea. And we hope also for the future, but mainly thank you all, all of you guys for being here, for making what we're doing important, for giving us your feedback. Uh, I'm proud for my colleagues, for, I'm proud for my team, I'm proud for our partners at the CPF. We really thank you. Uh, please stay tuned uh because there is so much more to to share and we need to get uh, from your side and we we are happy to keep sharing what we're learning from all these marvelous local knowledge uh so let's meet uh, in the easter holidays in the Cycladis, right before we meet in the summer because <laughs> uh time has come for some holidays for everyone libon uh thank you thank you everyone please reach thank out so for much. Hello, Any Brandi. islands or initiatives that were not mentioned during the series, we had to be selective because time is short, but there are many, many more initiatives on, on the islands and we'd be happy to share more information with anyone. Thank you very much. Nasia, we may yes. close with that video we had and whoever wants to stay, they stay or we say yes. goodbye with that video from some yes, lovely it's a short, people who had um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's a short video, actually not that short, it's around uh, so five or six minutes. Try to leave, guys, but you uh, know, if you want to stay, stay. We love yes, you already. Give me a, a second. Hello, Rade, how are you doing? Thank you all for being here. Thank you, presenters and super CPF team. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't have this one ready. There we go. Sorry for the delay. Enjoy.
I first went to Greece when I was 18, fell completely in love with the landscape and the history, and I've been back every single year since. It's a group of islands I've visited um, many times in my life, um, a place that I feel it's incredibly special to me and my family. Um, we've had lots of family weddings out there. And I think the Greek way of life is something um, to behold, something really special. I think the environment, the architecture, the history of all those places is just magical. There's actually nowhere on earth like it. Just the extraordinary culture and history and depth of civilization and warmth and wonder of the modern place is somewhere that we have to work so hard to preserve. Because of course, because it is so beautiful, um, it has become over-visited and, and we have to maintain its balance and really think about how it exists as an environmental entity. The thing I really love about Syros, aside from seeing my mum and family, is that it just feels so pristine. The beaches, the water, and even the countryside. It is one of my um, life's ambitions to go to every single one of these islands. How can you possibly choose between Naxos and Seraphos and Thera and Milos and, and, and all the wonderful places uh, with their unique gifts? Delos has to be extra special I think, the kind of magical mystery and, and ghostly wonder of the place. I think very sadly the sort of communities and the environment of those uh, very small islands uh, are under threat, under threat from plastic pollution and, uh, and, and modern living and uh, the Cons Conservation Collective um, and the Cyclades Preservation Fund uh, are trying to stem that, trying to stop that by raising money and uh, ensuring that those funds get into the hands of people that are on the front line and uh, that can fight back uh, against the threats they are under. Greece has one of the longest coastlines in Europe and sadly it has one of the poorest recycling rates as well. Recycling is just a part of the solution in a whole toolbox that's needed. We also need to look at alternatives and we need to continue to raise awareness of the damage of single-use plastics. Now when I was filming around the Greece stated to say that at so many of the bars and restaurants uh, a lot of the drinks and beverages came in plastic cups with not one not two sometimes three plastic straws in them there just seemed to be very little awareness of the damage that this kind of plastic is doing because that is exactly the type of stuff that just ends up going straight into the ocean and utterly devastating marine ecosystems so the local sea turtles and the dolphins marine life and of course the fishing stocks are all being impacted by this so it's something that we have to continue to work with and, and work on. You might not know this, but it's thought that we human beings are currently consuming a credit card size worth of plastic every single week. We're eating it, we're drinking it, we're inhaling it. Microplastics are a huge problem. supporter of the Cyclades Preservation Fund. They have a project running right now which is called the Plastic Free Cyclades Project and uh, what they've managed to do is install one of the first marine litter stations on the island of Antiparos and that's really important. Now you might tell by looking at me that I'm Greek and indeed I am. I'm half Greek on my mother's side, Chrysula, and that's why I care so passionately about this project and about Greece and about the Greek islands. <laughs> It's our wish to preserve the environment, the buildings, the communities, uh, and the way of life that's been going on there for hundreds of years, um, so that, that can be maintained well into the future. And I wanted to add my support to the Cyclades Preservation Fund, um, who are working to ensure the well-being of this incredibly beautiful and important group of islands. I'm just so glad that someone is keeping watch over those beautiful Greek islands because we all know how easily environments and coastlines can be destroyed. Please support the Cyclades Preservation Fund however you can. We would love your expertise, we would love you to help at community level and of course we'd love your money if you can donate as well. Please join with me in supporting this fund. It is so important. I wish you guys success at the CPF and thank you. Happy holidays and let's hope that the new year will be the start of change for the better.
Αυτό το βίντεο ήταν από, ε, από το δικό τη πρεσβεία. Όχι, this, είναι, είναι it's, it's just an older video. Because it says, you know, it was produced like uh, almost two years ago, but I think it's still, you know, like valid. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It was, uh, you don't want to leave. Day. It's amazing. So... <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Everyone. It's an honor. We wish you Hello, Rade. Have a good night. Hello, Rade. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon. See you soon. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Ani, we call each other. Huh? Thank you all. Yes, Pierre. Hello, when Rari. you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>